Bonjour à tous. Uh, we are really happy to have this uh, workshop here uh, in La Plata, in the Faculty of the Natural Sciences, which is, which is linked to the Museum of La Plata. Uh, we also have uh, some online uh, colleagues, I think, uh, uh, listening to the session on YouTube. Um, so we have uh, a program today with uh, uh, people who are members of the project or people who we thought would be uh, really interesting to hear uh, on the topic uh, of, of uh, casts and bones mostly. Um, so uh, the idea is to hear the presentation and that we will leave a lot of time for discussion so that we can uh, you know, exchange ideas about this topic of, of, of uh, the circulation of, 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 of casts and the interpretation of the bones and casts. Uh, we will also have some, some presentation online. So two uh, of the uh, participants of today are, are not here, but they will uh, participate uh, uh, from your uh, online. Yeah. Mm. So welcome really everybody. Thank you for all of you who are here and uh, also a lot of the ones uh, online. Yeah, okay. Uh, so as we work, uh, Ilya Newland, who was expected to come on Saturday to the camp, so he will be online. Uh, and the other presenter is uh, Olivier Barberol. He, uh, he was always thought online. And uh, so we are trying to keep the schedule of the program uh, because of the online uh, participants. And um, well, welcome. And um, let's start with Isabel, uh, Bonora, and Luca. Uh, yes, Isabel uh, works at the National Museum of Archaeology, which is uh, not in Paris, but in a, a city. Uh, around Paris, Saint Germain en Laye. It's a museum that was founded in the 19th century, and she's the curator of a very specific collection, uh, which is directly related to the topic of our uh, workshop today. So she will, I'm very happy that she could come, so, and uh, she will present this collection and explain what are the issues of. of, of creating this collection and how uh, it is important uh, to keep this type of collections in the perspective of, uh, of the history of collections and also the history of uh, disciplines here uh, at the History of Archaeology. So thank you, Isabel, and I leave you. Uh, thank you very much. So this is the microphone, I think. No, no, no. Sobre todo, buenos días a todas y a todos. Voy a hacerlo en inglés, pero luego si queréis podemos hacer el turno de preguntas en, en, en castellano, como, como prefiráis. And so, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, ¿Veis aquí? Sí, no, sí. No, estoy, estoy en el medio. Yo soy mi libro, yo soy la impresión. ¿Se ve bien la, la pantalla detrás? No estoy en... Ah, yeah. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And before, first of all, I would like to thank you, Nathalie Richard, professor of history contemporaine at the University of Dumont, as well as Irina Podgorny from the Museo de la Plata Conicet for their invitation today. And today I'm really glad to be able to guide you through the discovery of an almost unknown and uh, unpublished uh, collection today under my responsibility in the Musée d'Archéologie Nationale of Saint-Germain-en-Laye. And uh, without further ado, I'll start my today's lecture entitled, as you see, The Unknown Collections of the National Archaeology Museum and the Birth of Archaeology in France. So this National Archaeology Museum of Gallo-Roman, sorry, or Gallo-Roman Celtic Museum was founded on March 1862 
by imperial decree. It was Napoleon III who wanted to create a museum dedicated to the study of a new science that was then in Europe very in full expansion, and it was archaeology, and more particularly the archaeology in France. So this ambition was also linked to the emperor's fascination for Julius Caesar and to his will to publish the version of the Belo Gallico, the Gallic Wars. So to do so, Napoleon III brought together a group like us of specialists and researchers, military and architects, epigraphists and historians and archaeologists to study in one way ancient writing sources and iconographic, but also work on field research. So in 1867, barely five years after the creation of the museum, Philibert de Bonne, member of the museum, wrote, to found the Gallo-Roman Museum, it was not only necessary to gather a collection, it was necessary to create a science. The world is rigorously exact. The emperor, in creating the Gallo-Roman Museum, wanted to create, at the same time, the so complicated science of the archaeology of our national origins. However, Napoleon III did not want to create another uh, fine arts museum. He wished to build uh, a kind of um, uh, a museum of, of a new kind, in that it should be a scientific and educational. And when one speaks of uh, a science in archaeology, uh, one speaks of recreating and exposing contexts serious and typologies. So in order to restore as faithfully as possible archaeological context and try and not to remove collection for other museums, because at that time the learned societies and public in general were still very shocked about the first Napoleon Caesars in France and in Italy. So you must have this in, in mind. So the emperor decided to produce, then to exhibit facsimile of an extraordinary quality. And in 1863, Adrien de Lamperrier, who was archaeologist, numismatist and curator, in his notes of the creation of this museum, Gallo-Roman Museum, wrote, one should not hesitate to admit into the collection all the faithful facsimiles which could replace in the series the objects which one could not yet obtain. This method adopted by geologists has made great progress in the science. So these collections of replicas, which were then exposed in the same way it, and at the same value, the same importance as original archeological objects will illustrate the creation of the Museum of National Archeology span from 1862 till 1960. So with these replicas, which you can see here, it's here, all these replicas, which were basically made of plaster and metal, according to an uh, electroplating technique, the Museum of Saint-Germain-en-Laye completed this exhibition with an important collection of cork models that you can see here, representing Neolithic, uh, Roman and Gallo-Roman uh, monuments and sites, and with the restitution of war machines of the Roman period. So all this educational device made up of replicas, models, and restitution was completed by a modest in number, but very important in significance, collection of sculptures and paintings describing the birth of the archaeological science in France. Here you can see one of the paintings, and here one of the sculptures. Well, however, in, eight, in 1960, the museum is completely transformed, and this renovation that deeply uh, changed the character of the museum was carried by André Hermont, 
the architect, and by André Malraux, uh, that, who was Minister of Cultural Affairs at that time. And from now on, from the 60s, the archaeological object will become the real subject, the principal topic. And all these facsimiles that you can that you see before would lose their meaning and their value. And in the 60s, about 35,000 pieces were removed from the exhibition rooms and transferred into the storerooms. So in 1869, Gabriel de Mortier wrote in his publication, which was a kind of first guide for the museum, Promenade du Musée de Saint-Germain, in order to found his history of Caesar on as solid as foundation as possible, the emperor has numerous and important excavations carried out, cast several great monuments of Rome, drawn up plan et relief, and constructed Roman war machines, weapons, and costumes. This was suggested him the idea of creating a Gallo-Roman museum. So you have moldings, you have plants, you have war machines. All these words will allow me to present the six subsets that compose this collection and that we are going to discover together. So here they are, so always change the one. The cast, electroplating, uh, war machines, historical models, paintings, and a sculpture. So I will, anytime I will first describe the collection or the technique with a sort of introduction, and then I will give you a more detailed description of one, only one chosen and representative example for each of each subset. So if we begin with the cast, the cast collection is currently being estimated, but it could reach 25,000 pieces. And even if some of them are replicas of archeological pieces today preserved at the museum, most of them are facsimiles of original coming from other French or other European museums. Moreover, this cast concern all the periods today exposed in the museum, because it's an archaeological museum too, from Paleolithic to the Middle Ages period, also including at the end, the comparative archaeology section. So the question here is, how can such a large number of replicas be created and exposed in this museum? So in fact, while some casts are the result of acquisition or donations, most of the copies were made by and at the museum. Because in 1864, two years after the opening of the museum, Napoleon III decided to create a molding workshop specialized in the reproduction of archaeological objects. So the emperor found his inspiration in the Central Romanic Germanic Museum of Mainz in Germany, who was a model for him. This direction, the direction of this workshop was entrusted to Abel Maitre, you see in the screen, who was a sculptor, restorer, and molder who already worked for the Louvre's Museum at that time. So for the Musée uh, d'Archéologie Nationale, this reproduction, these copies, were used for different purposes, and we're going to see them together. The first, we already talked about it, the recreation of archaeological context, or serious, or typological serious, but also the reproduction of prestigious archaeological objects, of course. But they were also used for conservation, because you can preserve uh, the fragile, some fragile pieces made of organic materials like wood or iron, for example, also for researchers and ex exchanges because casting allows an access, direct access to extremely faithful copies and these copies traveled. And then finally, a commercial use, because the museum published in 1870 the first catalog that you see on the screen for the sale of these replicas. And you can bought, for example, replicas of bronze age weapons 
or Neolithic stella or the Trajan columns. So, Verchère de Réfi uh, wrote that in order to facilitate as much as possible the study of the scholars, we established with the problem of His Majesty a molding workshop dealing especially with replicas of archaeological pieces. These pieces will be delivered to all those who request them at cost price. All those who have visited the Museum of Mainz and who have seen the, the proper use that Mr. Linda Schmidt, his director, has made of this beautiful collection of cast, will be grateful to the emperor for having taken his creation under his patronage. So that right now I'm going to talk to you about the techniques used. So this, uh, the techniques used by the casting workshop of Saint-Germain-en-Laye between 1862 and 1960, so more or less 100 years, were basically three. Emoulage à bon creux, or mold in pieces, which are the most traditional ones, and is particularly employed to copy originals made in plaster or in hard materials like stone, marble, bronze, etc. And it allows the conservation of the mold. You can use it many, many times and make many, many copies. The gelatin molding, which is used by casting, you cast the, the, the gelatin, also allows the execution of several proofs, but the gelatin shrinks and cracks. So this technique has, has a limited life. And the third one, unlike the previous processes, the stamping or sand casting, which only allows the production of one or two prints. And it was mostly this one, this last one, used to produce a large architectural cast. Right now, gelatin and clay are not uh, longer used because today we, we use uh, mostly silicones, the, this elastomere that it's a, a great plasticity. So after this small introduction of the cast collection, I will now present to you a very special example for me, the replica of the Stratford Coat Wagon. And here you are the original one, not the replica, uh, but in 1851, there was an accidental discovery of a cult wagon from the Hallstatt culture and that caused a real steer in the international archaeological community and it is dated to the sixth century before Christ, and it is composed of a dozen very small figurines that shows a very complex iconography that was quite um, unknown at the time, even to the specialists. And it was called the Wagon of Stradbeck from the name of the city where it was discovered. And so in 1853, this original wagon was exposed for the first time in, uh, in Austria in the Joanneum Museum in Graz, and this exhibition was a resounding success. And this is how, in the winter of 1860, this Romano Germanic Central Museum of Mainz, I remind you that this is his first museum that inspired Napoleon III asked Graz in Austria the permission to make a replica because they wanted to complete their collection and the, their scientific purpose with a vaccine. But very quickly, this pedagogical and scientific value of the copy became also a commercial use because plaster replicas of this wagon were produced and sold in Germany. So between 1860 and 208, about 20 facsimiles were bought and exhibited throughout Europe, giving rise to this genealogy of copies that you can see on the screen. So the study of this genealogy is of a particular interest since each replica reproduces and illustrates the different addition and restoration made to the original. So in 18, um, 70s, the National Archaeological Museum of Sacha Naole, uh, of course, ordered a replica of the wagon of Strebley, it's the fourth one. And the question is, what does, here you have the replica, 
What does this replica tell us about the different restoration undergone at this original cult wagon in 1870s? And we are going to compare them together. So in the top part, you have both original, the one from uh, 1863, this is a picture taken in, the, in this exhibition, and the original now, after all the restorations. And here you have the replica from Saint-Germain-en-Laye. So we are going to compare them. So the Saint-Germain-en-Laye cast is the first in this genealogy to show a concave cup placed on the raised arm of the central female figure, as you can see here, because they discovered it after and they then added, but the replica from Saint-Germain is the only one who showed us. However, this replica does not reproduce the access that joined the cup to the platform of the wagon, which had, however, been restored at that time on the original, and that you can see now here, but we don't have them in Saint-Germain. In 1877, many years after, a last figurine of an armed cavalier was added to the Stradbeck card, and this figurine was founded and given to the Brass Museum after this first restoration. So the Parisian replica made seven years earlier doesn't show the existence of these four horsemen. And finally, in 1881, a total restoration was carried out on the original wagon and this wooden board, this wooden part, which all the bronze figurines had been assembled, was removed. So, however, this wooden uh, board that made in plaster is still visible on the Saint-Germain copy. In addition, I asked for a restoration in uh, 2021 because this replica was completely destroyed. I could, uh, after I could show you some pictures of uh, the replica before restoration. And this restoration allowed us to understand so many of the details of the production of this facsimile, such as the fact that the dozen plaster figurines had been molded individually, and then they have probably traveled separately and then were assembled in Saint-Germain and painted. So uh, it's, it is maybe because um, uh, Abel Maitre was studied in Mainz, and then he could be able to assemble all this uh, wagon together in saint germain -Olay. And this idea that we had was confirmed by, by several markings on the surface of the wagon. You have 17 times this same number, uh, number 15048. What you see here are red crosses you have this number, written, which is the inventory number attributed to each one of the parts of this wagon at its arrival to Saint-Germain. So the role of these markings is probably or certainly to list these separated pieces to avoid the dispersion when they arrived at Saint-Germain. So this was my example for the cast collection, and now I'm going to talk to you about electroplating collection. So I don't know if you are familiar to this technique, but it's uh, the way we can make metallic replicas after I will tell you about it a little bit. So electroplating is a recent technique developed in uh, 1837 and more or less simultaneously by Moritz Hermann von Jacobi from St. Petersburg and by Thomas Spencer in England. Although since 1805, for example, the Italian chemist Brugnatelli recovers metallic objects with gold using the battery invented by his compatriot Alessandro Volta. So electroplating allows the application of a metallic deposit on the surface of an object by means of a direct electric current while the object is in dissolution. So this is the principle is the electrolysis and that was first used by innovative goldsmiths 
for selling objects like uh, Charles Christophe in, in Paris, which was really very known even today. And this process allows bypassing the technique of gilding with mercury, which was particularly dangerous. So with its fine metallic deposits, even applied to surfaces, this electroplating also makes it possible to preserve an object from oxidation or to reproduce the object by <coughs> deposing the metal inside a mold. So the electroplating was uh, very quickly uh, used at uh, the Gallo Roman Museum of Saint Germain en Laye and at least since 1866. And I remind you that Napoleon III was also uh, very keen on new technologies and he will develop, among others, photography or experimental uh, archaeology for military engineering. So among the most important collections of electroplating created in the Musée de Saint-Germain-en-Laye, I will briefly talk to you about this Gilles collection. So it is unfortunately today uh, preserved in the store rooms because I have not yet uh, exhibition room for this collection, but they had, have been recently exposed <laughs> in the exhibition Paris Athens, the birth of modern Greece, which ran from September 2021 to February 2022 at the Louvre's Museum. So it was a really great uh, exhibition. And so Emile Gilliron, father and son, because they were together, here you are, have the father. We have not many pictures of this family, they were quite shy, we imagine, were the two painters, but also restorers and molders who lived in uh, who lived between 1850 and 1939. And after an important activity of restoration and drawing and digging on Minoan and Mycenaean archaeological sites, such as Mycenae, Knossos, Hagia Triada, or Faistos, Emile Gillian Fader founded in 1876 uh, a company of uh, official antiquities replicas. So in 1911, these replicas were also so success successful that the Gillian's catalog of Mycenaean antiquities was translated into German, English, and French, and included 144 pieces. Many museums, universities, and private collectors throughout Europe, but also the United States, and maybe here knows in Argentina, purchase these reproductions. So in 1894, Emile Gilleron's father, uh, who was then working for, with this famous archaeologist uh, Schliemann on the sites of Troyes of Mycene, decided also to reproduce by electroplating these Mycenaean antiquities from molds taken directly from the originals. And the Museum of Saint Germain en Laye was one of his first clients and acquire a set of electroplated objects. So the first item reproduced, then here you can see them, then bought by the museum were these gold caps of Vafium discovered in 1888 in a Tholos town near Sparta. If the copies were generally very faithful, on certain occasions, the Gillierons embellished their reproductions with a more or less fanciful interpretation. So this is the case of this replica of a uh, riton, which is a ritual vas vessel for pouring liquids, figuring a bull's head today curated at Saint-Germain. And for example, this double metallic axis were added. Uh, they didn't exist. And they were inspired very probably on the iconography of Minoan seals, but this addition strongly changed the appearance of the original. So today, the Gillian replica collection, which is curated at Saint Germain is composed by more or less 80 uh, pieces, including electroplating and plaster casts. And it's currently the topic of a research project developed in partnership between the museum and the French School of Athens 
and we can after discuss about about this. Here you have the you can Google it if you want it to. And then very quickly we're going to talk about this uh, war machine collections. So the war machine models curated at the, the Musée de Saint-Germain-en-Laye is today composed by about 10 items. We have four reduced scale models, onagers, uh, ballista, catapults, and then six real scale Roman war machines, including at Onega, three ballistas and two caro ballistas. So sometimes they were exhibited in the courtyard of the museum, but they were permanently exposed and so despite of uh, this big size inside the building, either in the entrance, as you can see, or in the Roman rooms next to the showcases exposing reduced scale models. So, Napoleon III, who during his exile was a captain of the, of the artillery regiment in Switzerland, was himself an artillery man and passionate about military engineering. And always following the footsteps of Julius Caesar, the emperor assembled a large amount of documentation about the Roman army, weaponry, and particularly artillery. So around 1860, Napoleon III commissioned the officer named Auguste Verchère de Réfi, and I open quote, quotes here, to experiment with the firing of Roman weapons reconstructed according to the documents he had collected. He was a, a politician working on modern weapons, and this Verchère de Réfi was one of Napoleon III's first officer between 62 and 70. So he was also one of the founding members of this Gallo-Roman Museum. And it is between 1860 and 1870 that these two men will lead a project of experimental archaeology by trying to reconstruct real and reduced scale models of Roman war machines. Whether this uh, vestige of Roman war machines are really very rare even today, and Verger de Réfi was mainly inspired by ancient Greek writing sources, such as the Greek treatises uh, like Byton, Philo of Byzantium, or a hero of Alexandria, or from Latin authors such as Vitruvius or Amanius Marcellinus. But also iconography was an essential source for his research, and Derefi will draw for, from the figurative representations from Roman monuments, and in particular, from the reliefs of the Trajan column, which describes, as you know, the Trajan military campaigns against the Dacians. So you can see on the screens uh, this picture from the Refi himself, which he taken when he was visiting Rome, and which is today created in the archive service in saint germain So all these models, reduced and real scale, were manufactured in the workshop of Meudon near Paris, which was a center of research for modern weapons. And it was financed by Napoleon III and managed by De Réfi, but mainly for strategic and military questions. But after the required technical te testing, they liked to play, and De Réfi used them to entertain the emperors and the emperor's entourage. And according to his expression in an open quote, it was a kind of archaeological representation. So it is notably under the Third Republic that several of these entertainments became public, in particular during the so-called scientific festival, which remind us now what we do in, in Europe every year, which are the Los Días de la Arqueología. Me imagino que aquí también tendréis Días de la Arqueología. No, pues en Europa es una fiesta enorme, Los Días de la Arqueología, y hacemos este tipo de the spectacles. Uh, and it is notably on the, so that we made this kind of 
archaeological days. But today, in fact, um, this, this, as you as you could see, all these war machines was exposed since the museum opened. But now they are all of them. They are transferred in the store rooms since 1960. Uh, where they are currently located, as you could see when you visited the museum. And now, I don't know if I, yeah, okay. I would try to be more short, maybe, but, and now I would very quickly talk to you about all the paintings collection. The painting collection created at the Museum of uh, National Archaeology assembles 31 paintings, including eight drawings, and 12 murals. Here you have eight of them. And you can see there are Gallo Romans monuments, uh, very, very beautiful paintings from uh, uh, Richard. And it is a relative modest collection in number, but very important in meaning, since it describes the birth of the archaeological discipline in the 19th century. It belongs to the genre of history painting. This archaeological painting is a category that is not very abundant, not very common, but which allow some painters, uh, such as Ludovic Le Pic, Fernand Ormond, or Maxime Febvre, to focus on it, notably around 1880. So they were inspired, inspired um, uh, by the rise of paleontology or prehistory and the archaeological science offered to these painters a new and a very suggestive topics like human evolution or humanity versus animality or human primitive origins. And I would like to present to you one painting and this oil on canvas uh, entitled uh, Village Lacustre, Lacustrian Village uh, from the Lac du Bourget and was a, a painted uh, by Ludovic Napoleon, Napoleon, it's everywhere, Le Pic, in 1869. So this painting was restored in 2020 uh, and exposed at the recent exhibition Allo Le Bourget, uh, who was exposed last, last year. So this Ludovic Napoleon Le Pic, the third count of Le Pic, was a French painter and engraver born in 1839 into a wealthy family with a military tradition. However, Le Pic had a bohemian life and was motivated by, by changing interests, among which was archaeology, of course. So living in Andrézy, a few miles from saint germain en it is likely that these artists followed the renovation of the chateau and the creation of the museum in 1862. Because in the second half of the 19th century, you know, this discipline, archaeology was fascinated uh, many, many uh, contemporaries. So Le Pic began to create, to assemble a very important collection of antiquities and especially to take part of the excavations, notably in France, in Savoie, Ardèche, etc. But but in a much more original way, Le Pic proceeded to experimental archaeology by painting pictures whose theme was archaeology. So thus, between 1869 and 1870, he painted three pictures describing Black Stream villages, which he later offered to saint germain le Museum. So, uh, unfortunately, this village of Grazine is the only example today preserved in the museum because the two others disappeared in 1930. In fact, the winter in, uh, of uh, 1853 was particularly dry and cold in Switzerland and this caused the, the lake level to drop. And this climatic phenomenon led to the discovery of exceptional, uh, exceptional remains vestige like, for example, clay, stone, metal objects, but also organic matter, like woods, bones, nevertheless. The study of this vestige that had been sent to saint germain en laye to be restored and, and created, allowed this painter to imagine and to figure, to copy, uh, the way of life of this population from Le Bourget, going from the Neolithic period to the Bronze Age. So as you can see in this painting, dominated by landscape, the human presence is 
limited to the lake village or uh, on the boats or on the footbridge in, in a group of six characters in the foreground on, on the dry land. Down here, the painter describes very different activities, fishing, hunting, by using to illustrate it, all the artifacts he studied and copied in the archaeological museum. He made a kind of archaeological experimental archaeology only by drawing. Now the sculpture collection in the museum, um, just like the painter, paintings, it describes the birth of the archaeological discipline in France and at the end of the 19th century. And it's a small collection in number, but one that preserves unexpected treasures also. Because this collection comprises about 30 works and it's mainly composed of busts of my famous personalities of the museum, as well as seven statues on the round. So among these, the characters represented by Bust, I could mention the founders of the museum, such as Napoleon III, represented here three times, or Eugène de Millet, architect and responsible for the renovation of the museum from 62 to, to the first uh, 20th century, who was a pupil of Violet le Duc, we can also find the busts of curators and directors of the museum, like Alexandre Bertrand and his successor, the very famous Salomon Renac. And finally, the museum curates about 10 busts of archaeologists, mainly prehistorians and paleontologists attached to the museum and who drew the evolution of the archaeological discipline in France. But of the seven statues in the round created in the museum, I would like to introduce the Roman legionary of the famous sculptor Auguste Bartoli. But this statue would deserve a precision since in fact it is not a statue, but rather a restitution model because it made in plaster in a real scale and it completed the didactic device of the exhibition in the 19th century. So in 1868, Vercher de Réfi, that you know already, this Napoleon III first officer, devoted himself to the opening of this room 13, and I open quotes, the emperor's favorite, where Napoleon III wished to exhibit the archaeological discoveries from Alessia. Alessia is the site with, with, with this Vercingetorix was defeated by Caesar's armies. So to complete the didactic tour of the room, Doréfi commissioned his friend, the sculptor Auguste Bartoli, to create a life-size reconstruction of a Roman soldier. Uh, it was only age of uh, 36, and this artist had just been entrusted with the production of the Statue of the Liberty, which is his most famous work. But Bartoli was an unfamiliar with the representation of antiquity and he used archaeological sources, both iconographic and material, to obtain the most faithful version of a Roman soldier. So for example, this plaster cast of the Trajan Column made by the museum in 1862 served as a model, for example, for the contrapposto, the position of the sculpture, as well as for certain elements for the soldier's panoply, the helmet, the cuirass, the tunic, and the shield. And for example, the sandals or caligae are copies of our original discovery in Germany in 1877, and which was curated in the museum in Saint-Germain-en-Laye since 1867. And this replica uh, was so intended to be faithful that the original sandal was also exhibited at the feet of the statue since the 19th century. So finally, also, the central hump of the shield, the umbo, 
as well as the javelin, the pilum, were inspired by discoveries from Alessia, which was molded after their discovery. So these prints were then used in the productions of weapons of the legionary and also for presenting today. And this sculpture, uh, with its great documentary accuracy, was a great success and had a lasting influence on the representations of Roman soldiers, and it became a real celebrity. And I suggest you to watch uh, some peplum films or to read Asterix, because you are going to discover him. And in 1926, uh, the historian Paul Poussin wrote about this Bartoli sculpture. Since Bartoli uh, Legionnaire was placed in the Saint-Germain Museum, it has been popularized by many, many reproductions in artistic representation and, and in the theater. And it's widely spread in books for younger students and more learned works. So however, this statue was also a victim of his success because on April 1938, his sword was stolen and the belt that decorated the central part of, the, of, the, of his tonic also disappeared at an unknown date. And very quickly, I will just finish with this historical model collections. Uh, this is the, the last subset of this Histoire de l'Archéologie collections, and it is made of 109 models. About only 30 models were made from 1862 onwards by Abel Maître, this chief on the casting workshop created in the museum. And these models will allow to complete the pedagogical exhibition. So the Abel, Abel Met model were made on plaster, only plaster, and then representing, represented Neolithical monuments, such as torments, menhirs, as well as the scale models of the sites where the battles of the Gallic War were fought. Sites were mostly excavated by, by Napoleon III in the 19th century, such as Alessia, Oxelodumum, etc. But the most important items of this collection are the 79 models representing Greek, Roman, and Gallo Roman monuments. And they are mostly made uh, in the 18th century, and some of them the 19th century, by craftsmen like Agostino Rosa or Antonio Kiki, and come from private collections such as Auguste Pelé, Casas, Chassel Bouffier, etc. So they are made of composite material, less, mostly cork, but also wood, terracotta, glass, vegetable foams, etc. Which uh, and, and now uh, I'm uh, undergoing a sanitary study, which allowed me to better understand the state of preservation, but also the techniques that were used in the manufacture. And this will be my last picture today. And just to tell you that these architectural models are attested in Italy since the 14th century, and particularly during the Renaissance, and were basically a working tool. However, in the middle of the 18th century, there was a phenomenon of mass production of this model intended for private collectors with an international distribution. So this phenomenon was generated in Naples and lasted about a hundred years and is in this city, Naples, that the technique of making cork Christmas creeps is attested as early as the 16th century, a technique that will be used in the making of a good number of these historical models. So these very precious objects have also a tourist value at that time since they are intended to become a souvenir to the wealthy European making the Grand Tour. They also have an artistic value, as you can imagine, by their aesthetic 
quality as well as by the nature of the object, which will be exposed in private collection like the Kant's camera, Kant's cabinet, or the public collection as well, but they also have a scientific value since they are acquired for educational purpose for museums or architectural academies. Thank you very much. And online in William Brussels and in English and Spanish. Oh, any language. Any language. <laughs> so, no, not, exactly. not German, not German, please. <laughs> so, okay. so, 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 but at the moment, our time is really as time is here, so it's more questions to you know, about details, uh, aspects of the presentation. I have a question about the do we know uh, who uh, bought the models that were made at Saint Germain? Do, do you have archives of the sales? That means I saw the catalogs. Prices. Mm -hmm. uh, so, can we trade? Like, for example, if we take the Basson to yeah. Venice, you should know. Can we trade? Who but, acquired, uh, but then, some of them, yes, but you know very well that archives are always uh, difficult to, to trace. So, for many of them, when we are lucky, because you, you can imagine we have more or less. 25,000. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we can know everything about all of them, but we can imagine because we have this inventory book mm -hmm. where we talk also about the museum uh, of the copy, where we send the copy or where the object came from. But because usually all these objects, the original ones, travel to Saint Germain, they were copied in this uh, workshop and then they went back to the original museum. So we can imagine that if the copy didn't went to this museum, they could be around in the city around or some private collectors collections in the city. We are not always lucky, but sometimes yes. Sometimes. Sometimes. Susana, eh, puedes hablar español y petróleo. Sí, sí, sí. Como tú quieras. Sí, sí, sí. 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 Trabajaban, después se iban y, y montaban su propio taller de técnica para cursos comerciales, para venta. Espera que voy a traducir. Ah, muy bien. So, the question is about the workshop in the museum. So, how, how it was organized, who were the workers, if they were artists, or if they were just for the museum, or they decided to open a workshop, a private one. So, la pregunta es muy interesante, realmente, porque hasta ahora, como a ver, estas colecciones de las que yo me encargo, eh, acaban de crearse como colección. Ya os he dicho que en los años 60 salieron, se transferieron de las, de las salas a las reservas y entonces fueron más o menos abandonadas. Entonces, eh, desde hace dos años solamente, esto existe como, como, como colección. Okay. So, because I have to translate. So the thing is that well, I'm talking. <laughs> uh, so that um, Isabel says that the question is very interesting, and it is. Uh, but uh, to answer it, she has to remind that the collections were out. Also, they are out of the exhibition. They were taken from the exhibition halls to the uh, deposits uh, in 1960. So I just. Um, 
the project about these collections started two years ago. Entonces es una cuestión en la que, en la que estoy trabajando ahora, precisamente. pero sí que te puedo decir que eh, Abel Metz, que fue el primer director de este taller, se formó en este museo alemán de Mainz, pero él ya trabajaba en el Louvre como eh, escultor y eh, él fabricaba ya copias, réplicas en, eh, en yeso. Ok, so, um, what Isabel can say today is that Abel Metz Uh, the, the first director or the first person in charge of the workshop um, uh, worked before uh, in Mainz and uh, in the Louvre uh, as a sculptor and he, he had experience and he had an expertise in making a uh, cast uh, in other places. Mm -hmm. Pero en ese taller también se empezó, se, se empezó a hacer otro tipo de técnicas, como la galvanoplastia, esta de metálica, y también restauraban los objetos arqueológicos, los originales, y también hacían los montajes. Entonces, era gente completísima, y en el mismo taller no se sabe muy bien cuánta gente trabajaba, es lo que tengo que, que empezar a, a, a definir ahora, pero se cree que unas 15 personas. Y también depende de la época, porque a partir de los años 20, Empieza a abandonarse. Okay, so uh, in this workshop, uh, um, um, the, the several techniques were uh, developed and used. Uh, all the techniques he mentioned in her presentation, but um, the, the estimation number of people working there is about 50, but it depends on the period because in the 19, uh, this is what she can say until the 1920s, but uh, at, um, after uh, that those years, the workshop is a, uh, started to decline. So the number of people working there and the final activities um, need to displace uh, disappear or starting. Y para contestar más concretamente a tu, a tu pregunta también, entonces este taller poco a poco hay, hay cartas que se escriben al ministerio diciendo por favor no nos abandonen, esto es un ejemplo increíble de un taller que no existe en ningún otro sitio, etcétera, etcétera. Y pues la mayoría, eh, luego por ejemplo este Abel Metz al principio tenía su propia empresa, pero luego ya se vino a San Germain. Y luego ya trabajó en Saint-Germain y no trabajó en otro sitio más. Luego también estaba un señor que se llamaba Champion, que también pues, trabajó durante más de 60 años en el museo. Y eh, luego en París era una ciudad en la que había muchísima tradición, muchísima, bueno, y en Francia, de estas copias en, en, en yeso, muchísimo, muchísimo. Y los talleres eran muy, muy, muy numerosos, muchísimo. Entonces... Muy, muy frecuentes en París. Infrecuentes. Y frecuentes, frecuentes, frecuentes. So, um, first of all, this, this man who was in charge of the workshop in the museum, he had a, a, a private enterprise before, but he left the private uh, uh, enterprise for the museum. So, um, But uh, Isabel remembers that in Paris, this kind of activity was very common. So it is very, very, very uh, normal to have other uh, workshops all offering the same kind of objects and what? <laughs> Any other question, preguntas? Yo tengo una. Si quieres consultar, en esas réplicas tan reales que se de armas, en alguno de esos objetos, si sabes si se trataron también de reproducir las condiciones en las cuales se hacen, es decir, usar las herramientas que tenían disponibles al momento de la producción de ese objeto original, ¿no? ¿Se hizo ese ensayo? Se sabe si en algunos de los sí, casos se hizo sí. y cuánto tiempo tardaron en hacer esa, esos objetos, las réplicas. Mm -hmm. Ok. There are two questions. One about the. Yes, there would be. Okay. The first one would be But. if when the, the replicas were made, uh, if the, the, the person, the group of persons that made them, 
try to, to also use the same tools they had at the moment, the originals for that. It would be one question. <laughs> yeah, and how long uh, it, 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 mm -hmm. uh, that the spread was done? How long did it, how much time did they have to spend to be able to do the replica? Mm -hmm. A ver, eh, entonces, para empezar, tienes las réplicas de, de gran dimensión de las, de, las, eh, de las máquinas de guerra romanas, ¿vale? Entonces, ahí ya tienes un ejemplo de sí, lo hacían, e intentaban utilizar los mismos materiales eh, que en la antigüedad, intentaban utilizar. Entonces, ahí ya tienes una primera respuesta, y el tiempo, no tengo ni idea para esas máquinas, pero eran meses, porque eran, se utilizaban después para intentar fabricar máquinas de guerra de la época, contemporáneas, para utilizarlas, porque estaban en tiempo de guerra también, Napoleón y este Versailles de Regis. Entonces, eso la primera o sea, parte. No vieron, claro, no vieron nuestros objetos que vendían. Sí, sí, sí. ¿A o trampa? No, 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 no. no. Ah. Y ahora, o sea, le dejaba que tradujera y luego te contesté. No, pero traducimos, Sara. Eh, eh, bueno, translate. Ah, algo más que no, la respuesta. Ah, oh, Dios, yo, yo, yo. <risa> I can, I can make it. <laughs> they use um, the historical materials and the historical techniques. Mm -hmm. So that's the answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pero también lo hicieron con las armas de más pequeña dimensión, de, por ejemplo, eh, armas, espadas o cascos de, desde época neolítica hasta época romana. Hicieron también eso pero eh, no lo hicieron en yeso, porque lo que les interesaba era intentar... Hicieron tres tipos de réplicas, en yeso, en galvanoplastia, pero también réplicas reales, como lo que hoy en día llamamos arqueología experimental. Entonces, intentaron reproducir el mismo tipo de metales, el mismo tipo de materiales, pues los mangos en madera, la cuerda... Realmente, como la arqueología experimental hoy en día, tenemos muy poquitos, tenemos muy poquitos ejemplos, pero hay ejemplos que también se eh, exponían y era en muchos de los casos porque eran muy conscientes de que la pátina podía dar ese aspecto, pero no daba la materialidad del objeto. Entonces eran perfectamente conscientes ¿eh? de eso, solo que era mucho más caro, mucho más tiempo y tenían un experto en, en, en yeso y en pátina, porque este señor era... Un, era un dios en la patina, ¿eh? o sea, hace, hace cosas increíbles. Hay veces que no, no llego a distinguir una copia de si no lo tengo en la mano. Pero hubieron ejemplos. No sé cuánto tiempo se tardaba, no, no lo sé porque no hay nada que los describa. No lo sé. Entonces, eso no te puedo contestar. No, yo pensaba que después de decirlo, hoy en día tenemos. Eh, espera que traduzca. Ah, eh, so, the thing is that, eh, so, this guy, so, eh, Isabel presented different techniques for reproducing the things, for casting. But um, what, what today we call experimental archaeology, that, that is reproducing the uh, old techniques and the old materials, it was also done in, in, in this museum as a kind of uh, technique for doing, uh, for reproducing things. She doesn't know how long this process did take, Any, because there are no records about the production. So there is no. Um, a diary of mm -hmm. production. So, what, Yara? No, lo último, porque yo pensaba que hoy en tenemos eh, un montón de herramientas alternativas para resolver diseños, ¿no? mm -hmm. de clavo, todo lo que imagino que en el momento se han asustado más frecuentemente, no existía, no sé, no soy sí, sí. de los proyectos, es una barbaridad. Ah, no te puedes imaginar la cantidad de instrumentos, o sea, los instrumentos hoy en día lo único que ha evolucionado con respecto a los instrumentos que utilizaban ellos son los que utilizan la electricidad, los numéricos, los escáneres. Si no, los artesanos hoy en día utilizan exactamente las mismas herramientas que se utilizaban en la época. Entonces, eh, era gente, y además eh, llegan a producir copias bastante más fieles en algunos de los casos de lo que podemos hacer nosotros, porque la técnica hoy en día se ha perdido, se está perdiendo. Entonces, podemos, sí, hacer un escáner maravilloso con un miles de una nube con miles de puntos, pero esa nube con miles de puntos, eh, las copias que podemos obtener, por ejemplo, con imprentas, son malísimas hasta ahora, no llegan ni a la, vamos, 
no, no se pueden comparar con esos objetos de, de aquella época. Eh, ¿Aquella época? Del siglo XIX. Del siglo XIX. Entonces, sí, sí, no, no, tenían un material.
directora adjunta del Museo Latinium en FIFA, en el Chate. Y bueno, no quisiera que te diga la vice director del Latinium Museum en Switzerland. Eh, okay, um, so I'm going to, to talk about a case study which is uh, well connected to the previous presentation. Um, it, I'm going to talk about Latin, the Latin casts, so objects of Latin which uh, were molded, cast um, at the National Museum of Antiquity in Saint Germain en Laye. So it makes a link, a link with the previous presentation of uh, Isabel. Um, I'm uh, relying for this presentation uh, on uh, different uh, studies which has been made on these collections of Latin, circulation of collections of Latin, and especially on one publication on the left, you see La Collection du Site de Latin, conservée au Musée d'Archéologie Nationale de Saint-Germain-en-Laye. So there was a, a big uh, research project, an important research project conducted um, between Neuchâtel, Switzerland, and uh, Le Musée de Saint-Germain-en-Laye, uh, uh, with different contributors. You have the list uh, under Okay, just to remember uh, Latin, where is Latin? So this archaeological, very famous archaeological site, uh, it's just at the, um, the, the extremity of the Lake of Neuchâtel. You see here the Lake of Neuchâtel, the city of Neuchâtel, and Latin is here. Um, and I think that the, this case study can be interesting for our um, concern today. Um, about castes and circulating of castes from the point of view, from another point of view. We had the point of view of the Musée National, des Antiquités Nationales of Saint-Germain-en-Laye, which is a very centralized institution, as you could understand. And there is a commercial dimension by, um, with these castes, which are made there. Uh, the idea was to uh, diffuse these castes in different institutions, like, uh, yeah, at the Museum of uh, Mines, for instance, uh, where the idea wa was to present references collection and casts were a way of um, showing this um, references collection. Now I would uh, take the history from another point of view, from the other side of the lens. So from the point of view of Neuchâtel and from Bill also, so two um, uh, peripheral uh, places, I mean, today, but at uh, the moment, so in 1860s, it was a very important place for the development of archaeology and prehistory, in particular, Neuchâtel and Ville also. So, um, the site of Latin was discovered, some people already uh, heard the, this history of the discovery of uh, the site of Latin, was discovered in 1857, by a fisher uh, called Hans Kopp, who was um, collecting objects uh, from the Lake of Neuchâtel. So he was fishing antiquities in the Lake of Neuchâtel, and he, he discovered a little bit accidentally, by accident, uh, this site of Latin in 1857. So you can see here on the left side a representation, an engraving of this fisher Hans Kopp, uh, and on the right, you can see a um, painting of the site of Latin in 1879. Um, so it was, um, it was discovered by this fissure, but uh, this fissure was, uh, so as many fissures at that moment who were working for collectors, uh, they were discovering um, lake dwelling settlements. Uh, Isabel to was talking about uh, site lacustre before. Uh, so they were um, discovering uh, that kind of settlements and the site of Latin was interpreted at the beginning as a lake dwelling settlement as well. But one of the particularity of this site of Latin is that the objects the people, so this fisher and the collectors could uh, find, were made of iron. This was something very particular because all the objects which were found on lake dwelling settlements 
were made of stone, ceramics, as you said, but also bronze. But we didn't find uh, objects made of iron. So this was something uh, particular. Um, you have um, on this picture two important actors of the moment, the collector Friedrich Schwab on the left and uh, Ferdinand Keller, who was the founder of the Antiquarian Society of Zurich. And uh, both uh, this both uh, person uh, have played an important role in the recognition of Latin as a new uh, archaeological site. But for these people, um, the chronological dimension of this object, the fact that they were made of iron, didn't really interest them. In fact, they were only uh, considering that it was another lake dwelling settlement, but they didn't really integrate it, this um, material dimension of iron in the rezoning. So they published a Friedrich Schwab for whom Hans Kopp was working, uh, this fisherman, uh, contacted very quickly uh, Ferdinand Keller, who published uh, the first discoveries of Latin in uh, the um, bulletin, annuary bulletin of uh, the Zurich Antiquarian Society in 1858. And we see very well uh, that uh, for them, um, these objects of Latin were really part of this lake dwelling thing, this uh, theoretical lake dwelling um, uh, interpretation, which was uh, introduced by Ferdinand Keller. So all these objects were presented as a whole as uh, objects coming from late dwelling settlement. Um, apart from the fact that they were made of iron, the Latin artifacts uh, had other special specificities. First, these objects were largely weapons. So a lot of weapons, swords, sword scabbards, along with numerous other, ob of ob other objects, such as fibulae, tools also. But the quantity of weapons immediately struck the actors of the moment. And the second characteristic was that the state of preservation of these pieces of iron was particularly remarkable. For the antiquarians of the 19th uh, century, iron was associated usually with the Roman period and the Middle Age, but even for these periods, when found in excavations, iron objects were rarely well preserved because iron doesn't preserve very well. Uh, there is a lot of corrosion usually. So when you find pieces of uh, iron in ter terrestrial settlements, uh, they usually um, look like a, a block of corrosion and the shape of the, the object is usually uh, not very uh, recognizable, um, ca cannot be recognized very well. In Latin, the shapes uh, of the objects found were uh, very distinct due to the prolonged stay of the objects in the water because these objects were uh, had been preserved really in the water. So there were th three elements um, which were important with these objects, the material, the fact that they were in iron, the form and function, the fact that there were many weapons and the state of preservation, which will be decisive in the role Latin would play in the construction of the chronologies of European prehistory and in its role as a reference site for European um, uh, Celtic uh, civilization, and which brings us to the question of the caste. So a few months after the discovery of the site, the naturalist Edouard de Sors uh, um, started to study this, uh, this series uh, of uh, objects. And um, he, um, contributed, in fact, with these objects to construct, construct the chronology of the European Iron uh, Age. In fact, what he did is that he compared, um, so he recognized that the fact that there were uh, iron 
pieces, objects made of iron, um, that it was interesting for the chronologies. At that moment, um, at the National Museum in Copenhague, the antiquarian Christian Thompson and his colleagues had established a chronology based on a material language, the three age system, uh, in which the stone, bronze, and iron ages followed one another. And for the Sor, it was uh, logical that Latin was more uh, recent than the lake dwelling stations that had delivered stone and bronze objects. Um, and the Sor went further in his demonstration. In 1862, he compared the Latin objects the weapons, but also the fibulae and also the iron tools with material culture discovered on other sites in Switzerland, in Bern Tiffenau, but also in France with the objects of uh, Alesia, the site of Alesia, the battle site of Alesia, uh, excavated uh, between 1861 and 1865. Uh, for the Sor, Latin uh, materially characterized an anti-historic period at the junction between prehistory and history, which uh, illustrated what others used to call the Gallic civilization. I'm thinking in particular of Napoleon III, Napoleon III, who founded uh, the National Museum uh, of Antiquity uh, in Saint-Germain-en-Laye in 1867. So Latin became the site that would crystallize the issues relating to the characterization of the Gallic civilization, and Napoleon III would uh, logically seek to acquire objects of Latin for his museum. So you see Napoleon III uh, on this uh, picture, but also other people <laughs> Isabel already uh, talked about, Abel Maître here, but also Auguste Vercher de Refy and uh, our two uh, Swiss uh, naturalists and collector, Edouard de Sor and Friedrich Schwab. For this, uh, Nap Napoleon III contacted Friedrich Schwab and Edouard de Sor in order to obtain reference pieces for his collection. So the letter preserved at the Man today, but also at the Latinium and at the Museum Schwab in Biel, have made it possible to reconstruct the history of this movement of objects. And um, so we see that in 1863, Napoleon III sent his officer, uh, Auguste Vercher de Refy, to Switzerland to visit the collection of uh, Friedrich Schwab. Uh, Vercher de Refy wanted to have casts of Latin's weapon made, so for the Museum of uh, National Antiquity in Saint-Germain-en-Laye. In 1864, it was Edouard de Sor who was in contact with the private secretary, the direct secretary of Napoleon III, this one was ready to offer the Sor 40,000 francs to acquire the whole of his collection. But the Sor declined this proposal, considering that the collection of Latin should remain in Neuchâtel. The Sor will instead offer casts of his objects and 12 double doublets, which are also very interesting objects, maybe to take into account in this question of castes, re reproduction, facsimile doublets are also kind of current money, money d'échange uh, between these institutions and collectors, between collectors and institutions. So uh, the sort uh, offered doublet to Napoleon III and also the possibility of making casts of his own collection. He will receive, because it's never uninterested, that kind of exchanges. The Sor is expecting also things from Napoleon III, and he would receive from, from him casts of weapons from Alesia. So this goes in both senses, directions. In 1864, Schwab was contacted again by Napoleon III, who offered him not to buy his collection, 
But Napoleon III offered uh, Schwab to pay him in exchange for a regular supply of antiquities coming from uh, lake dwelling settlements, but also from Latin. In fact, Schwab was recognized in all Europe, uh, in all this um, milieu of uh, uh, emerging, emerging uh, prehistoric science in Europe. The collection of Schwab was recognized as one of the best one, as one of the richest uh, one. Uh, Gabriel de Mortier says that, says, um, makes this comment about the collection of uh, Schwab. So uh, Napoleon III was very interested by Schwab activities. He knew that he could find very uh, good objects, the good one uh, to have in collections. So he offers Schwab to pay him um, in order to be um, to get objects from him regularly. And the emperor offered Schwab a starting sum of a thousand francs, but Schwab declined the offer, probably often did by being treated as a mere digger because he was a collector. He was not just a digger. He was not a fisher. He was a collector who had an important collection. And probably he was a little bit offended by the proposition of uh, Napoleon III. Later, Schwab would be contacted again by the Museum of National Antiquities to obtain casts. And in 1865, he sends uh, 40 objects to the Musee, uh, Museum of the National Antiquities to be cast and offered also 25, uh, 27 pieces of his collection as a gift to the emperor. And again, it wasn't uninterested. Uh, Schwab was expecting uh, from the emperor a gift and he would receive um, a hunting rifle uh, a gun for yeah, a hunting rifle from the emperor who uh, was dedicated to Friedrich Schwab because Friedrich Schwab was practicing, was a hunter. Uh, he was collecting antiquities on the one hand and he was hunting animals on the other hand. <laughs> Maybe the same practice, a little bit, <laughs> the same observation. Uh, uh, competencies. Uh, so he was very happy with this, um, with this uh, solution. <laughs> um, so later on, uh, like in 1874, we still have tra traces of uh, exchanges of castes between Swiss uh, collectors also uh, between Dussor and the Museum of the National Antiquities. So it continues a little bit. And then uh, we have another important moment, which is, uh, so we change, uh, the people uh, change a little bit. So we are later in 1912, the context is a bit different. Um, we are at the, during the, big excavations which were uh, undertaken at Latin at the beginning of the 20th century by Paul Vouga, uh, who was um, the conservator of the archaeological collection at the Museum of Neuchâtel, who was responsible also for uh, this uh, big excavation at Latin between 1907 and uh, 1917. And in this context, as you can see on the pictures, um, objects of wood were found in this excavation. Probably that, uh, and it, it is sure that uh, Schwab and uh, so in the 19th century, they also found wooden objects, but they were not really interested by this kind of object. So they didn't really, um, uh, think about uh, preserving them. It wasn't a problem in the 19th century, the fact that these objects were not preserving uh, because they were interested by reference collections. And the, the question was weapons of iron and not really objects of uh, wood. But uh, during this uh, excavation at the beginning of the 20th century, 
the question of the conservation of uh, wooden objects is uh, at stake. And Paul Vuga organized uh, cast, cast um, production or cast, um, uh, yeah, production, let's say, in situ, as you can see here on the picture. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, here you see, there is this person here who is Charles Caspar. He's a preparator uh, uh, who works at the National Museum of Zurich. And uh, Paul Vuga was in contact, of course, with this National Museum of Zurich, which is a little bit uh, like the national, yeah. I mean, Switzerland is a confederation, so the National Museum is very important, but it's, it's not a centralized, a centralized country. So the National Museum, has a certain importance, but museums, cantonal museums have, or city museums are also very important. But at the National Museum of Zurich, they have also reference collection and they make cast of different objects of interest found on archeological sites uh, in Switzerland in general. So uh, Caspar came to Neuchâtel in order to realize these casts. And uh, the, the cast he is realizing on the picture is the cast of a shield that you can see here on the picture just discovered uh, in the excavation. Caspar uh, um, uh, set up his laboratory uh, of uh, cast production uh, for a while uh, at the Museum of Neuchâtel in the basement. He stayed uh, some for, for some times uh, in the Museum of Neuchâtel in order to produce this cast of uh, wooden objects. You see also on the picture a wheel of wood, which was also um, uh, molded and uh, cast uh, in, uh, in these years, and which are still in the collections uh, of the, uh, the museum. So in 1912, um, Vuga had, had the possibility of reproducing object because Caspar had made the, um, the the mold, I don't know the name, l'empreinte, en fait, the, the piece with which you can reproduce many, many objects. So he had the possibility to make casts in Neuchâtel or in Zurich and to send these casts in different museums. That's what he did in order to uh, represent the collection of Latin in important places, reference places, like the Musée of the Antiquité Nationale, but also like uh, the British Museum, like other museums where uh, casts were sent, like the Museum of Mines, uh, for instance. And so in 1912, Vuga offered the man, again, casts of the most beautiful wooden <coughs> objects found in his excavation, a yoke, so a joue, a shield like on the on the picture, a spear with its shaft, so the handle also of tools which were made of wood. He made a cast and he proposed the man uh, some um, reproduction of this object, but also chariot parts which were preserved uh, in the in the excavation. So here, the casts uh, served as an inter-institutional exchange again, uh, the possibility of reproducing these pieces in numerous copies allowed Vuga to place his discoveries uh, in this place of reference. And in return, Vuga asked for a set of Magdalenian flint casts and also for photographs of the painted caves of the Vézère in Dordogne. So the idea was to, again, obtain something in exchange. So as I said, <coughs> Latin objects, casts of Latin objects were realized by the, also by the Römisch Germanisches Museum in Mainz, but also <coughs> by the British Museum in London and already at the end of the 19th century. 
Um, maybe uh, to conclude, uh, <laughs> I'm perfectly in time, very happy. <laughs> to conclude, I would insist um, or emphasize that in the case of Latin, as I said, these casts are still part of the collection of the, of the museum. But today, we can consider that these casts, of, uh, especially of wooden objects, have a status of original. And this is very important because, uh, of course, these casts are interesting for the history of the discipline, for the history of exchanges, and the history of the economic and commercial dimension of the scientific practice in museums, but also by independent collectors. But these casts can also sometimes be the only trace of objects which existed, but which completely disappeared because the material disappeared because um, uh, like wood, for instance, organic material, uh, was, wasn't completely uh, at the moment where they were found. Uh, they, uh, the archaeologists didn't um, master their conservation process of this object. And so this object completely disappeared. And here I, I um, took some pictures of the casts which are presented nowadays in uh, the Latinium exhibition, in the permanent exhibition. You can see, for instance, the wheel of Latin, and we show uh, just beside the state of the wheel today, which is completely uh, unformed, completely deteriorated, because at the moment of their discovery, we didn't manage to, we couldn't, it didn't master uh, conservation processes uh, to, um, to preserve this object. And this is also the case the right side with these handles, these tools, which uh, handles are made of wood. So we have traces, thanks to this practice of cast, of uh, this object, which uh, are, have completely disappeared today. So saving what was this time to disappear was another virtue of this caste practice uh, in the 19th century, but also uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Thank you very much. As you can adhere to the next presentation, and then the rest is online, we yeah. Yeah. can discuss it. Yeah. Presentation together? Yes. Yeah. So, that's the question that I have. Is that the question that I have? 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 Is Pero yo no lo veo. Dejo de compartir. Sí, compartir. Olivier, ¿vos estás la? Ah, bueno. No. Se acaba de desconectar. ¿Se desconectó? Está, estaba conectado. Ahí está. Acá el micrófono está silenciado. Ah. Olivier, ¿vos estás la? Ah oui. Bon. Et me... Olivier, vous n'avez pas votre micro. Olivier, le micro. Olivier, le micro, s'il vous plaît. C'est bon. Ouais. Vous m'entendez Non, on ne vous entend pas. Non. Essayez sans votre casque. Ok. Il y a un problème avec le sonido Eh non. Comme ça, vous m'entendez mieux Ton micro-phone est silencieux. Toujours pas Ok, désolé. Et si acá tengo que activer el audio, no va a pasar nada, ¿no? Activer el audio. El anfitrión dice que. A ver. Ahora sí que hable. Permanece silencieux. Déjà enlevé mon casque. Vous m'entendez toujours pas Permanece silencieux. Oh. Moi, je vous entends. 
Olivier, ahora bueno. le... Pero lo está haciendo, no, yo, está haciendo todo. ¿Me lo... entendés bien o no? ¿Vos me escuchás? Hay dos fantasmas, ¿viste? Es que no se ve. Pero por algo a él no se ve. Sí. Vale, ahora, ahora, ahora. Sí, sí, sí. Checo a que me van a acabar. Uy, uy, ayúdame. Moi, c'est parfait pour moi. Je t'envoie le fil à l'eau. En juillet Oui. Oui, parfait. Ok. <rire> donc, oui, maintenant, ça va. Wow. <rire> bon, et, et Olivier va me rendre des. From Paris, um, 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 he did a PhD on the cast of animals, and so this is the topic of, from of his presentation. And well, we are very happy to have you at least on the screen. Thank you very much. Okay, Arisi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, vous m'entendez bien? Okay. So, first of all, Uh, I would like to thank Irina Podgorny and Nat Irisha for this invitation to talk about my research today. And I should also apologize in advance for my dreadful English. So you, you are. <clears throat> uh, as you know, for a long time, uh, French publications, especially we, oui. Oui, uh, désolé. Uh, especially those of the Natural History Museum of Paris mostly focus on prestigious characteristics. Uh, the age of its foundation, its renowned scientists, its major scientific department, and their contribution to science. Uh, C'est bon, je peux continuer. Oui, oui, tout va bien, on vous entend, pas de problème. Oh, on vous a... oh. Allez-y, allez-y, tout va bien. Je suis désolé, bien. désolé. Je... Attendez, trois secondes. Pardon. Voilà, désolé, je m'entendais en écho. OK, so, uh, in contrast to Anglo-Saxon publications, which have long uh, emphasized on invisible technicians, the smaller and auxiliary services were relatively absent from the French monographs. Over the past 15 years, this tendency has declined, but one auxiliary service hasn't yet been studied, the molding studio of the Natural History Museum of Paris, or the uh, casting uh, workshop, established in the late 1820s. Uh, 20s, sorry. According to the archives, the most productive period of the molding studio was from 1845 and 1890. During this period, the service was managed by an experienced molder 
Jean-Benjamin Stahl. Uh, Stahl who produced a very large number of casts over an extremely long period of time. He made a rich variety of casts for all the departments of the museum, from anthropology, comparative anatomy, paleontology to zoology. According to the sources, the reputation of this practitioner and of his molding studio will have contributed to the fame of the museum. During his lifetime, he was considered as one of the most excellent molders by the museum scientists, by French scientific and technical societies, and also by art associations. At the end of uh, his career, and when he retired in 1890, several newspapers dedicate, uh, dedicated Dituambical articles to him, uh, such as a very chauvinistic journalist, Antoine Francais, who assumed that Stahl, the mother Stahl, was the subject of an international rival rivalry. In the newspaper, Le Voltaire, he estimated that, I quote, foreign scientific establishment envy the museum for its murder, end of quote. In reality, it was mainly the museum's professors who instigated this type of reflection about the molding studio. For example, as the paleontologist Albert Godry, the last professor who had Jean, Benza who had Jean Benjamin Stahl under his responsibility, devoted a small publication to him in which he considered that thanks to Stahl, I quote again, the molding studio of the museum has acquired uh, its reputation in the world of French and foreign naturalists, end of quote. Similarly, during the career of the molder of the museum, the uh, esteem, the esteem of the scientific staff was frequently revealed through various marks of recognition. Contrary, uh, by example, contrary to the usual practice, professors of the museum often mentioned Stahl's name in their scientific works, praising the quality of his production so strongly that at the end of the century, it was said at the museum concerning the collection of casts made by Stahl, I quote, to name this skillful artist is to give an idea of the beauty and trust of his preparations, end of quote. The museum obviously strove to enhance the prestige of its molder and of its production. The reason is simple. The casts were important because they were the object of many transactions, as you know, and as for the nations and especially exchange between institutions. So by praising its casts, the museum would attempt to guarantee their quality. The guarantee of the origin can be moreover found uh, in funding it found in the wax stamp of uh, on some, uh, some of these casts, like this one. You, you can see, donné par le Muséum d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris, given by the Natural History Museum of Paris. So <clears throat> one should certainly not fall into the trap of overestimating over the importance of Jean-Benjamin Stahl, as Mulder, by considering him as a member of the scientific staff. He was above all a simple technician and an auxiliary of, uh, to the scientists. Nevertheless, nevertheless the, lack of, uh, the lack of knowledge concerning the activity of the museum's molding studio creates, creates sorry, a gap in the history of science. For my part, my research concerns mainly the life casts made on the, the animal from the menagerie. This study could contribute, maybe, to a better understanding of the role of this artifact 
in the, in the collections are the interests with other stakes related to the molding studio from the point of view of the museum uh, museum's professor. Among the stakes, there is one that I consider particularly significant, which is the struggle between the professors to take the molding studio under their authority. It appears that the possession of this service enable to enable the development of their department. So without a doubt, the best documented casts of the museum of Paris are the paleontological casts. There are uh, several inventories and correspondence about the species in the archives. Moreover, the, these casts have a special status. Unlike fossil casts, zoological casts are not a substitute. They do not replace natural collection. Their materiality, the plaster, prevents them from being considered uh, as natural specimens. They were rather additional collections. Consider of lesser value and because of their statues as artificial collection, artificial, artificial collections, sorry, animal casts were gradually removed from exhibition spaces during the 20th century. Many of them were thrown away mainly between the 19th the 1960s, sorry, and 98, 1990s. According to our first investigations uh, at the museum, there are only about 60 animal casts left in the reserve. This number is nothing compared to the production of the molding studio. The historian of science, Cédric Crémière, in his thesis on the Gallery of Comparative Anatomy, points out that in the middle of the 19th century, the number of casts amounted to more than uh, 4,100. Uh, 4, Therefore, the plaster casts still preserved in the museum give only a very imperfect idea of this production. There are still a few casts of little interest from, the, from the, the current museum's point of view, and in a rather poor state of preservation, which is store, which has store in a storeroom, like you, you see. Uh, yet these pieces are important for the history of science, uh, of science exhibitions. They are mostly cast of cetaceans, cetaceans of, Mount, uh, maritime mammals. I, they were, were commissioned by the professor of comparative anatomy, Georges Pouchet, who wanted to create in the 1880s a kind of artificial uh, cetacean to compete with the collections of the American Museum of Natural History of New York. Other more spectacular, spectacular casts are kept in good condition in the museum. Uh, in the reserve museums, in the museum's reserve, sorry. There are painted casts, especially busts of primates. Um, we try to find some information of the species. And uh, like this plaster, <clears throat> this plaster, which corresponds to the discovery of the gorilla gina. Uh, in the middle of the, of the uh, sorry, a, of the 19th century. Uh, as you can see in this view, it did not replace the natural specimen, the taxidermy of the gorilla, but it was exhibited next to it uh, in an uh, in a 1852 report. The professor of zoology explained that it was the first gorilla observed in France, and the cast had to attest to the strange physiognomy of this animal. It served as a proof. Here, the cast had the same role as the photographic pictures that were also exhibited. 
together, uh, they were supposed to give an exact ID of this specimen. In this sense, the plaster casts were more perfect reproduction uh, of the animal than taxidermy. Nevertheless, uh, there was one case where casts replaced a natural specimen. It was in the context of lesson given uh, at the museum. Indeed, the archives attest that from at least the 1860s, several professors preferred casts for their public lessons. For example, in 1861, the professor of comparative anatomy, Etienne Serre, considered that Stahl's casts were very practical for demonstrations in the auditorium. First of all, because they were more manageable for the demonstrator, and also because they were more readable for the audience. The professor especially pointed out a specimen normally preserved in alcohol, which was difficult to use during the lectures. To replace these pieces, he mentioned several of the casts made by Stahl that he regarded as formidable didactic tools. We have found only three of these plaster, uh, plaster of, of fish and two casts of snake. This cast uh, can therefore be linked to the history of pedagogy. Several elements still testify to the pedagogical function of the museum's cast. In particular, Zeus then uh, were used by art schools. As you can see in the caption of this image, the plaster casts were diffused and some of them are kept at the, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts de Paris, the official art school in France. <clears throat> this is also uh, the case with this cast made by Stahl using a process he invented. They are like petrifications of li uh, living animals. The molder euthanized the animal and using a chemical process throws it in the desired posture. These live casts were widely admired and commented on as they could be used as animal model in schools. The museum obtained from the Ministry um, of the Ministry of Public Education to exhibit this astounding, 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 astounding this cast at the Universal Exhibition of 1878 in Paris. During this event, other spectacular pieces made by Stahl, uh, some of prestigious collection of the museum have been exhibited too, like the cast of the Megatarium School that the museum distributed. As, well, as one can see, with this kind of event, event, the museum largely contributed to the fame uh, of its molder as much as to its own reputation. The study, uh, to study the role of the molding studio is to examine, examine the internal life uh, of the museum. The museum being a kind of micro society. It is also to better understand the role assigned to each class of personnel and their very, uh, and I have, uh, hierarchical uh, place. It is also to understand some of the causes that allowed to department, the department to develop more than others. Indeed, I became interested in the molding studio after reading archives, revealing a struggle between museums professors for the affiliation of this service. It appears that for most of the 19th century, the molding studio was uniquely under the authority of the professor of comparative anatomy. Thus, by supervising the molding studio, the professor of comparative anatomy had, all, had also co the control over the constitution of all the artificial collections. On this subject, 
uh, numerous reports reveal the internal tension uh, this, pose, this power caused. But uh, it was with paleontology that the tensions were strongest. First of all, the professor of comparative anatomy objected strongly to the creation of the Department of Paleontology in 1853. The professor felt that this department was useless. The actual reason was that the fossils were simply kept uh, at that time by the Department of Comparative Anatomy. Moreover, when the Department of Paleontology was fin finally created, the professor of comparative anatomy refused to give up this collection, his collection, his paleontological collection. This subject has already been very well studied for a long time. But the role of the molding studio in this quarrel has still not been studied. Uh, the, the professor of paleontology struggled to build his collection while Thanks to the molding studio, the professor of comparative anatomy obtained new, uh, new ones. Indeed, with the molding studio, he controlled the exchange of fossil casts between the scientific establishment abroad, obtaining casts for, of fossil against other casts. Better, he controlled the uh, excavation sites the professor of comparative anatomy sent the molder on the sites of extraction of fossils. Uh, then, after the uh, extractions, the fossils were sent directly to the comparative anatomy laboratory and first were out of the hands of the Department of Paleontology. The professor of paleontology was excluded from many discoveries and um, for example, during the important discovery of the Mammutus Meridionalis in the 1870s, it was the Department of Comparative Anatomy uh, that was called upon to extract the specimen with the model. Stahl was responsible for consolidating the, the fossil which was in danger of falling apart. The professor of paleontology was only a spectator of this great excavation with, uh, which was completed in 1875. The professor of paleontology could not direct the study of the fossil. And finally, this paleontological discovery was presented to the Academy of Science of Paris, not by the professor of paleontology, but by the professor of comparative anatomy. Uh, after this event, the professor of paleontology, Albert Godry, therefore request the official control of the museum's molding studio. It was successful in 1879, so four years after the case of the Mammutus Meridionalis. This transfer is very interesting because it reveals the importance that small services could have had in the development of departments. Indeed, it appeared that the change uh, in management of the molding studio corresponded to the great development of the Department of Paleontology at the museum, at the Paris Museum. Uh, I don't have so much time, I see. Um, you, you prefer that I conclude? Okay. Uh, I conclude. If you may, yes, we can discuss later. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Five, five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, you have um, five minutes if you want. Okay. Okay. I take it. So uh, this episode uh, of the the change in management of the molding studio uh, has another interest from the uh, social history perspective of the museum. It signals a change of uh, the um, a change in the. Uh, hierarchical uh, relations between technicians and professor. When the professor of paleontology obtaining, obtained the molding studio in uh, 1879, he also, he also obtained the paleontological collections that had 
that had been kept uh, in the Department of Comparative Anatomy. However, before exhibiting this new collection in this gallery, uh, he, uh, Albert Godry revised the panels of the fossil. He, removes, uh, he removed the names of all the professors of comparative anatomy, and he replaced uh, them by the name of the craftsman, this invisible technician, uh, those invisible technicians who had executed these pieces or proceeded to their assembly. That is to say, the <clears throat> name of the assistants and uh, the models. Whatever the relish, the reason, sorry, that dictated its choice, by doing this, Godry participated in transforming the statue of auxiliary personnel, the one who uh, had long uh, the one who had long demanded scientific rec recognition. I'm sorry. In conclusion, with, uh, with a view to rewriting the history of the museum, it will certainly be appropriate to increase the number of studies on its craft corporations, such as the Molding Studio, in order to bring to light their role, central or secondary, in the constitution of knowledge. This work could initiate new dynamics and provoke a new look at this collection, which are still too neglected uh, in the Paris Museum. This patrimonial process will certainly contribute to a better understanding of the pedagogy, pedagogical function of these specific artificial collections, or even improve our knowledge of the social history of the, the scientific establishment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Olivier. Um, we have time so, for, for discussion, like half an hour for discussion of the two last uh, presentations and then if you want to include also Isabel presentations so uh, I can speak the questions to you in French if it's easier for you Olivier if there are questions in the yes there is a question no no I, I will I can I can also uh, the question is, is there a catalog or an inventory of the casts that were presented at the Universal Exhibition in Paris or more generally? It, it, what, a catalog of all the malls or the ones that were presented? Okay, is there a catalog of, uh, of the molds that were made at the museum? Est-ce qu'il y a un catalogue? Uh, no, there, there is no catalog, uh, no inventory uh, of the, this cast in particular uh, in the museum. There is a sort of uh, inventory, but very incomplete. Uh, of all the pieces who, which are, uh, was made in uh, the ana uh, anatomical uh, uh, department. But uh, no, uh, there is a gap uh, in the archive about that. No. So, so okay, you also <laughs> have a, this was a question from, from Alejandro Martinez from, from, from here. From La Plata. Now we, you have a question from Isabel Bonora from uh, Saint Germain. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
todos, sobre todo en la, la persona que está en la parte de y la persona que está en el mundo. Y también quería decirle que en el pasado se está enojando a otra persona de la redundancia de Michael de Benzú, porque no lo conozco, Michael de Benzú, y ella se le transformó en una mujer y ella se confundió con los chicos de Chucky, escribió la de Bonchu. Okay. Uh, the question, Olivier, is how these people were uh, trained or how did they acquire their skill uh, as molders? Uh, so, uh, quel type de formation d'où est-ce qu'il vient? And Isabel says that in the passage des panoramas in Paris, on the front of one of the shop, there is uh, the exact replica of the mega serious, uh, mega mega serious, uh, mega du megatherium. This one, this one. Okay, no, 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 the mega serious. No, no, the okay. one late. Okay, this one, the one that is on the picture here. There is the exact replica of this on a shop in the passage de panorama. So just uh, above the, the, the front of the shop. So I don't know if you know about this. And the no. question is, uh, okay, so you, you may <laughs> look, uh, but uh, do you have information about the training? How were they trained? Uh, okay. Uh, Est-ce que je peux répondre en français? Je ne sais pas si la question a été formulée en français. En espagnol. Oui. Et, euh, vous pouvez répondre en français, je vais traduire. Allez-y. Euh, C'est gentil. Français, je vais traduire. OK. Euh, pour pour l'éléphant méridionaliste, ou l'éléphant du fort, je ne savais pas du tout que le passage des panorama, du panorama... Non, je crois que euh, c'est le méga hein. Le méga, le méga qui est derrière. OK. Et non, je ne savais pas non plus. Je vous remercie pour, pour cette indication. Je, je, je regarderai, ça, ça m'intéresse beaucoup. Et par rapport à la formation, effectivement... Une grande partie des aides naturalistes, et pas seulement les mouleurs, euh, mais aussi beaucoup d'aides naturalistes qui euh, réalisèrent par exemple des croquis auprès des, euh, des professeurs du muséum lors de dissections, etc. Ou de, lors de... Oui, c'est ça, de, de dissections. Euh, sont en fait euh, tous quasiment d'origine euh, de, de formation euh, artistique. Euh, ils ont fait euh, parfois, pour beaucoup d'ailleurs, l'école des beaux-arts. Euh, c'était quasiment effectivement une étape euh, indispensable ce ne fut pas le cas de pardon je ne peux pas faire trop long uh, so the answer is that most of the molders but also most of the drawers at the museum were trained at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts which is the fine art school in Paris so the artistic training was the kind of basic requirement um, for, for them je vous laisse continuer, voilà, j'ai traduit. Ouais, C'est gentil, <rire> merci, je suis désolé. Et dans le cas de Stahl, du Mouleur Stahl, euh, il a une formation en fait euh, très tôt, euh, à 14 ans, euh, dans un, un musée euh, scientifique, et je ne sais plus lequel, de province. Euh, il a commencé tout de suite, effectivement, à réaliser des moulages. Donc, sa formation, elle est vraiment une formation euh, sur, le, sur le terrain. Ok. The exception is Stahl, uh, the one who made uh, some of the molds on the so-called living animals, but I heard that he killed them before molding them. Uh, but, <laughs> and uh, Stahl was trained in a provincial museum in, 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 in France, so he was not trained as an artist, he was trained within a, a museum. Merci. You have another question. Il y a une autre question au fond de la salle. If you speak slowly, it's okay for me, but speak slowly, please. <laughs> Los mismos soportes, los mismos 
o lo que pude entender y lo que pude ver en la presentación, es que están generando materiales lógicos en el contexto mundial, en el mundial de nuestro país, también, donde hay una superposición y un palincesto de muchos materiales de distintas épocas y de distintos años. ¿Cómo hacen para ordenarlo cronológicamente, psicológicamente, en el museo una vez que lo recuperan y los limpian? Quelle est la question ah, Tu peux me... Can you translate Ok. Oui, oui. Le premier, j'ai commencé à te l'oublier, mais tu es plus sûr de la manière... It's on the way the specimens are, are mounted or presented. It's not about your task, but it's about the way of exhibiting and mounting skeletons and the, 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 the comment is on the similarity. Uh, between the skeleton mountain in La Plata and in, um, in France. So I get about this general uh, way of presenting and mounting a skeleton, not about your uh, cut. And the second question is about more the chronology, how in the 19th century the chronology of the site was made, because since everything was found together, So, uh, uh, and how uh, archaeologists in the 19th century could distinguish the different um, periods and contexts in the uh, northern superconstructs. Okay. So perhaps Olivier, if you have information, uh, est-ce que uh, si vous avez des informations sur uh, le non pas les les moulages mais plutôt les montages de ces spécimens, est-ce que ce sont les mêmes acteurs? qui remonte les ou qui monte les, les spécimens euh, euh, avec tous ces supports et puis toutes ces toutes ces structures en, en métal j'imagine mmh. euh, voilà donc peut-être si vous avez des informations sur ça oui j'avais compris la première question mais du coup j'ai pas compris la, la seconde mais je veux bien répondre à la première sur la le... n'est pas, pas pour vous en fait elle est pour Géraldine ah, Delay donc euh, voilà. <rire> bon, voilà. euh, par, rapport, <coughs> par rapport à tout ce qui est euh, technique, euh, les, euh, les montages justement, <coughs> euh, les, tous les métiers qui sont appelés pour faire les montages, ça on a une très très bonne documentation, soit aux archives nationales, soit aux archives du muséum, on connaît tous les noms euh, des, des gens qui ont euh, réalisé les montages souvent, et aussi les entreprises qui sont appelées finalement pour faire euh, toutes ces structures sur les fossiles. D'ailleurs, ces structures, elles, elles font, ça donne toujours lieu à des appels de, de, de marché et ce sont plusieurs entreprises de serrurerie euh, qui, euh, qui proposent leur, euh, effectivement, un devis. Ok, je, je vais peut-être déjà traduire euh, cette partie. Je... So, uh, there are lots of uh, archives about uh, the mounting and the structures that are supporting the The, 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 the mounted uh, uh, animals uh, because they were made uh, outside of the museum by specialized uh, companies uh, who were uh, specialized mostly in uh, fine metallurgy, especially locks, uh, uh, who were also, yes, could also uh, make this structure. Uh, so there are, and so we have names and information about who did this, this type of, of structure. OK, je vous laisse, uh, si vous voulez ajouter autre chose. Et euh, non, je, bah, je, juste les, effectivement, par contre, les, les montages, ils sont réalisés toujours sous la direction, effectivement, des, des titulaires des chaires, des, des professeurs des départements, et euh, souvent avec les aides naturalistes. C'est euh, effectivement... Euh, un travail euh, qui n'est pas seulement confié à l'extérieur, il, il est euh, toujours supervisé effectivement euh, par, chaque, euh, par euh, le personnel du, euh, de chaque département. Ok. 
Uh, and then the mounting itself is made always made under the supervision of the uh, the professor who was the chair, so paleontology or comparative anatomy most of the time, and uh, by the helpers, the ed naturalists, which are the technicians, the, the helpers in who are taking care of, of, of the collections and preparing the specimens. Uh, so the the the, mat, the technical aspect is is is. Uh, made by spe special companies, and then the mounting itself is made uh, on site by uh, under the supervision of the of the of the professor. Okay. Uh, and the second question was to Geraldine, and it was pardon. La deuxième question était pour Geraldine. Elle concerne la manière dont la chronologie des sites. Uh, est, euh, est, est établi ou euh, étudié euh, euh, pour les sites de lacustre de Neuchâtel. Objects are very different in terms of diversity. Uh, this is why Laden has been used to define and to uh, define uh, an archaeological period, which is the second Iron Age in Europe. But uh, as we know, an archaeological site is never pure in terms of chronology. There are always uh, different moments of observation. And when they discovered uh, what objects of Latin, and I um, show it in my presentation, um, the collectors didn't distinguish these chronological things. They saw that there was some like stone, that there was ceramic, there was also bronze, and that iron was something uncommon. But there was this uh, example of some who were very vested, not by uh, building any of uh, yeah. Uh, cultural attribution in terms of people to the object, like uh, collectors or antiquarians did at that moment. They were talking about the lacus with all these people, and there were the same people living on these uh, villages, and they were seeing a civilization. Whereas uh, the sun was thinking more in a uh, naturalistic perspective and was distinguishing periods of times which were uh, corresponding to um, uh, ensemble, ensemble, but which he could connect to the material and which uh, creates the them. So he was, he was more uh, reflecting in terms of evolutionism. evolutionism um, in the uh, archaeological perspective. And so the sun um, really distinguished very clearly this material from the sun to say this is the second iron age. And then this kind of objects, the psychology of, of the objects of the sun, of iron, became the reference for this period. So it was. Uh,
Je vais faire une traduction anglaise après, Alice. Je vais... Attends, attends, attends. attends. Pause. <rire> Stop. OK. Euh, Olivier, euh, pour vous, la question, euh, je vous la pose en français, puis je la répète en anglais, euh, est euh, sur les techniques euh, qui sont utilisées euh, au, au muséum, donc euh, les types de techniques qui sont utilisées pour fabriquer ces, ces moulages. Est-ce qu'il y en a plusieurs euh, Donc, pour Olivier, voilà. Ou s'il y a d'autres techniques que celles du plâtre. Uh, so for Olivier, the question is about the techniques that were used uh, to do the casts at the museum. So we saw mostly plaster techniques, and Isabel is asking if that there were other techniques. Okay. <coughs> um, alors pour uh, pour c'est bon, je commence. Oui, oui, oui. Parfait. Ah, okay. <laughs> Dans le, dans le cas de Stahl, c'est quasiment la seule technique qu'il utilise, c'est le, le plâtre, effectivement. Euh, Je n'ai pas connaissance de cire, par exemple, euh, qu'il aurait réalisé, mais en même temps, effectivement, il existe des cires qui ont été réalisées à la même période. Alors, je ne sais pas si... Euh, Je n'ai pas les archives pour savoir si ces cires ont été euh, réalisées par euh, une entreprise extérieure ou, euh, effectivement, si euh, Stahl posséder cette technique. Dans les archives, je ne l'ai pas trouvé. Effectivement, euh, les professeurs n'en parlent jamais. Mais euh, par contre, il, y a beaucoup de, il utilise beaucoup de techniques différentes par rapport au plâtre. Et c'est quelque chose que je n'avais pas dit dans ma communication. Euh, il imprime pas mal d'innovations. Il fait beaucoup d'inventions même euh, sur le, le procédé du moulage. Il obtient même plusieurs médailles, neuf médailles euh, pour, euh, pour ses inventions qu'il n'a pas breveté, mais euh, qu'il a exploité et qui ont été sous, très souvent commentés. OK. Uh, so, Olivier says that for Stahl, uh, he knows only of uh, plaster techniques, but there are, je ne me souviens plus du mot pour dire uh, cire. Wax. Uh, wax. There also are some wax models that were made at the same time, so we, but he doesn't know if they were also made by Stahl or by somebody else. But then he added that Stahl invented a lot of techniques, of new techniques to do the molds uh, uh, with plaster. 
that he, 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 he got uh, nine medals for different uh, in innovations in, in, in plaster techniques for uh, uh, molding uh, animals. So he used plaster, but invented lots of techniques uh, to do his plaster models. Voilà, j'ai traduit. Merci. Très bien. Merci. And the second, the second question was for Geraldine, and it was about the use of, of uh, cast as preservation, conservation technique. Uh, so uh, to keep uh, what was possible to keep of the object when the object was decaying or the techniques at the time couldn't help preserving the, the object uh, itself. So I think it's the main question. And so, okay. Uh, okay. The, and the question was uh, uh, if uh, the circulation was uh, of, of the ca the casts of the molds to make the cast. Yes. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, in uh, 1816, uh, Bessel and Schwab sent original objects to be cast by Avenue uh, uh, in And then the original objects he was sent back to his collection. And so the molding and the innovation of the cast was made at the museum project. And then the example I gave with the dog gap in 1912, uh, it's a bit different because um, the, the cat could uh, be realized by the National Museum of Zurich, with this preparator called Charles uh, Gaspard, who came in situ to make uh, the cat uh, in situ in the Chatel. And there, at that moment, Luca has the he has the molds. That means that he can reproduce uh, the casts. Mm -hmm. And what he offers to the man are the casts, mm -hmm. which are already made back and which are part of this. Uh, uh, now, I think that he sent the casts and not the molds. Because the molds are stayed in Zurich or in the Chateau, yeah, before uh, the original yeah. object in the, in the 1860s, the objects were sent there. Was that. And there was this question before about the time uh, they used to remove to make the cast. And I had the impression that it. They did it very quickly. I think that there is the example of the start who sent because we have all the examples in the list of objects, original objects, which had been uh, had been sent to Saint-Germain, and the moment where the objects went back to the hotel. And it seems that in one month the casts had been realized in the case of the start. So it's quite, uh, it's really quickly. Because we have also for preservation reasons, uh, we know that in Saint Germain they could go to the site and make a copy, a replica of the seal, not yeah, only yeah, the yeah. object, but also the seal yeah. that they were expecting. That could answer maybe your question about how do they know all these different layers? Because sometimes that they molded the layers too. And this they did it in one day, mm -hmm. one two days. And then they painted them, but this because maybe have to, to think about two different <laughs> first the plaster and then the color. Can you speak in, in English because yes, it's much easier? Okay. Uh, I want to ask if you have a connection to have a 
and way of knowing that the modes are the original ones. In Mark, how do you know that the remote is the original in like the first part? Ok, la question c'est de savoir si le moulage est, est l'original, le, le premier exemplaire. Comment est-ce qu'il y a un moyen de, le, de les savoir s'ils sont numérotés Est-ce qu'il y a des indications Alors, Isabelle répond déjà pour Saint-Germain et puis on va vous poser la question à Olivier. Euh, non, le cas. Ah, le mold. Vraiment, je pense que. Non. La question porte en fait sur les, les moules, pas sur les exemplaires moulés, mais sur les moules. Est-ce qu'il y a une collection en muséum de ces, de ces moules Est-ce qu'ils ont été conservés Non, ils ont tous été détruits en, en réalité. Et pas non plus, il y a très peu de primo-moulages. Ce sont tous des, quasiment des surmoulages aussi. Les pièces que je vous ai montrées. Okay. Sont, sont... The, the molds were not kept at the Museum of Natural History, so you don't have any. And most of the casts that are shown are not the first cast, but Uh, sur moulage, over, over cast, recasted, I think, according to the original, and most of the originals are lost. Oh. So, I, I don't, you know, we, we have to, we have to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I want to make a more point about that this kind of history of science we are presenting here is based on objects and techniques and people that, as Olivier said, were invisible or uh, are not treated in the, in the old way of doing history of science as part of the history of science and as part of the practice of science. We were talking about antiquity fishers, we were talking about moulders. So, and to show how this, all these activities are part of the uh, practice of science, but also part of your history paying attention to the object. Science generates giant continuum and science and science produces. And this this, you know, and what Isabel is saying, what Hiroshi is saying, and Olivier said that you know part of those colleges that arose because they were not conceived, conceived but they were not treated as part of the system of science. So they did also to reflect for all of you of how to do history of science. Taking another kind of material and not idea, not only ideas and not only individuals, but the object science is generating. So I think it's something very ecological. Yeah, and also I may add that uh, what we saw this morning is that these objects that are not original objects and that most of them were discarded in the in the deposits, they participated to the construction of, of knowledge. They were very important in the because they, in a way, when an object moves, I, the ideas that are connected to the object also moves. So, for example, for Latin, uh, it became um, this reference site because the saw did this chronology, but also because objects or casts from Latin were sent to many, many other collections so that. This reference site was a reference in the idea, in the interpretations, but also in the collections. So all, everything is linked. And so science was not only uh, made on original specimens, but also a lot uh, on all these 
now discarded, often discarded specimens and, and models and, and casts uh, that, that circulated. So uh, this is not only a material and social history, it is also in a certain way an, an intellectual history that we can write through uh, these objects. Yeah. And now you understand why we call the project that scientific collections of the news. So this is what, <laughs> yeah, in a, I, 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 I hope you hear what we say, Olivier, is it okay? Mm, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> and, and Mostly don't... okay. Okay, so just no. uh, we're saying that this is the, the, the exact uh, focus of, of our project to uh -huh. focus on, on on objects, but on not only specimens and on objects moving, uh, and uh, to do both history of collections and museums and history of science. And so this is exactly what uh, the communications this morning, I think, showed very clearly. Um, so we right. now have a break of, uh, uh, well, we begin again with the communications in, in the afternoon. At, let me give you the time. Quarter to three. At, at, uh, um, yes, at, at uh, a quarter to three. Uh, during this time, sh 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 we have a poster session here. So this is not going to be online because this is technically impossible. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, on streaming or uh, um, on Zoom, uh, we meet again at a quarter to three, at uh, 2.45, at uh, 14h45. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Olivier. Merci, merci On aura d'autres occasions de, de discuter euh, à Paris euh, oui. bientôt. Merci. Je vous remercie, c'est moi qui vous remercie infiniment.
from different intelligence, they're working in the same equation to present. And even when you see some of the presenting an empirical case, it is very much connected to the debate, or it is similar in form uh, to the debate that happened in the late or the second half of the 19th century or the early 19th century about uh, the character of the traces. Uh, legs, bones, if they are human or natural, and this is the reason we invite him uh, here to connect this contemporary problem to our historical debate. Thank you very much. I've been given only 20 minutes, uh, which is very unfair. Uh, possibly the revenge to be a sway alongside the confusion on the days of the asylum, I should have prepared. But anyway, uh, here we are. I about to tell you uh, about this uh, particular site in, uh, near Montevideo, in which the a couple of things uh, Irina mentioned and uh, interest. A uh, place uh, not far away from the Leo, only 35 kilometers, uh, in a place in which uh, the beauty of the landscape uh, says nothing about the treasure that are uh, hidden below the waters of this particular stream. Um, we had to, to make a severe uh, treatment. <laughs> A secondary course because the fossiliferous layer is very important. Discovered those houses. I negotiated that with Kurosawa. You have to stay I have the microphone. Okay, yeah, you, you, you can stand, stand, stand but stay, not, not stay, stay, yeah. stay <laughs> around here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much because of this uh, technical uh, <clears throat> advice. I try to stay over here, defend my tendency to walk about <laughs> my framework. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> academic speech. Um, heavy machinery had to be used to. Uh, build a secondary course to uh, dry the stream and access to the to the bottom, which is the fossiliferous level. Uh, and we had to make a dam with with uh, dirt bags originally, which made us very tired. Even before we started working in the collection of fossils. Now we go to this other equipment called Aquadam, commercial brand. Uh, they made our lives easier, despite it is uh, a rather dangerous thing of over 100 tons of water about to fall up in your heads. Uh, the lagoon should be emptied. Uh, the um, sound of uh, pumps are permanent while we are working. Um, and all that to access this, this uh, treasure, this uh, wealth of fossil bones of the very particular, very spectacular megafauna that's present in these areas. And some of you that are not <coughs> from over here must have seen in the uh, La Plata Museum. And those who are from here are very particular, some of course. Um, in this site, we, uh, we, we covered our, our childhood uh, eight years um, because uh, we, you, you work in Mars, you are in Mars all day long collecting fossils with your bare hands, which is the easiest, the safest way of getting them. Uh, and there are thousands and thousands of bones that we uh, collect protecting us from, from the heat of the summer, from, from the sun that uh, falls up on the, <coughs> the side uh, within, in the surroundings of uh, those cows that are made to the uh, wealth of uh, these countries you are visiting or live in. Uh, and this, this has to do with collections and heritage and the usage of those collections 
the, the eyes of children when they are shown those marvelous things of nature that are the fossil bones of this, uh, those giant mammals. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, James Vistos in excavation because it's very close, it's only 35 kilometers from the center of Montevideo, and this is my wife that uh, <laughs> brought us some ice cream, which was very handy during the summer. Um, uh, the neighbors, uh, <laughs> those, uh, this, this family, they are, they are characters and they are very helpful. Without them, we shouldn't have uh, had the success we, uh, we had in uh, exploring the site. Um, <laughs> and there you are. There you are. Those, are, those were my credentials, but I had a requirement to use wood instead of coal. And that wouldn't be uh, granted. And apart from my confusion, that indeed is me uh, to serve you with my knowledge of uh, <laughs> cooking. Uh, the difficulty of access of uh, the site and the need to, to let the water in again once we leave. Uh, and there are many academic issues about this. Uh, how this site was formed is one of the important things paleontologists always have to answer. And in this case, uh, it's very unlikely that uh, this site was formed of the very stream that runs today over it. And, and here you have the collection as it was in 2012. Those are three years of excavations. 1997 is the first one made by the community during a severe drought summer of that year. Uh, and this, the middle row is the second excavation, the first we paleontologists made. And the third one is that of 2012, which was the wealthiest up to today. In, in those times, we had uh, 1,500 fossil extracted. Now we are over 2,000 of those giant animals with only a very small area. The whole site has been being excavated. We expect to collect in the future, I don't know, thousands of thousands of uh, more fossils collected of those giant animals. The, well, this is the primary time, the current, the current mound as a skeleton in life position, but we uh, constructed one and chosen the shortest of us to for reference to <laughs> improve the efficacy of, of the, the, uh, the size, impact of the size of the animal. <laughs> Uh, some of the species are, that are found, uh, ground sloths, glyptodons, toxodons, uh, some of them found here as well, and you can see in the very nice museum. This megafauna was so extraordinary that compares very favorably with the African megafauna that exists today. A safari in time should have been even much, even more impressive than a safari in Africa nowadays. Those are some examples. I will go fast. Uh, those are reconstruction of the Xenathlons, very weird animals. <clears throat> uh, Iridodons, Iridodons, this uh, relatives of armadillos, but a very big size. Uh, one of the genera and this uh, giant club used very possibly as, as the you know, Middle Ages. Uh, weapon because some some uh, indentation in carapaces uh, so suggests. Um, well, other things about the habits of uh, megatherium. I was the crazy guy. I, I was younger then, but not crazier. Because uh, that megatherium would have had a diverse diet than originally thought. Information. Uh, other animals like the toxin is very important because uh, Darwin collected the skull and bought it uh, by uh, 18 pounds of the time, which is something less than six pounds nowadays. So, 
uh, bodies from, from some boys that were throwing stones at, at it, uh, using it as, as a target. And of course, uh, Darwin perceived the importance of this megafauna was, I think, the first influence for his proposal of the theory of natural selection, because he understood very clearly that this fauna with no major changes in the environment had gone extinct. Again, the shortest of us, uh, <laughs> well, uh, holding a uh, Sorry, um, holding a, a femur of uh, one of those giants lost. And also, small bones are collected. I can't move enough so anyone can see because of the uh, microphone. I'm sorry. Um, this is, this is uh, one of the surprises that the age of those fossils is rather old for a place that's inside 30,000 years in the past. <clears throat> Is it too old, considering that some of those bones have cut marks, marks we attributed to uh, tools, to, to human agency? Well, we, um, we submitted that to uh, several journals over and over again until we built up enough evidence to have it published, which I pass in very quickly, but those um, uh, Reactions of the scientific community are worthy of some consideration, but eventually we gather enough evidence for the paper to, to be accepted, like those indentations, some tools, not very clear because they are older than we uh, are used to find in sites with uh, human presence in. in in South America. Eventually, we published after having been rejected in Nature and Science in this uh, in the proceedings of the Royal Society, which was was very very emotional for us. I, I imagine uh, you know old guys with white wigs <laughs> <laughs> writing with quakes, uh, accepting our paper. Uh, well, once it was well published. Some uh, <clears throat> discussion was open about the age, about the agency of the cut marks, about the equitality after which different causes can uh, yield the same results, and some statistics proving that even though this was possible, the probability that none of the 15 bones we studied with cut marks, none of them had having been made by human agency was so low. If you have to bet, bet that this is a site with human presence. And now um, the last evidence was that uh, the usage of uh, machine learning is an intelligence approach which gave us very uh, good results as well, very high probability that several of those cut marks have been made by, by tools that were the result of, of human action. Um, and well, and this is uh, important. Uh, uh, one of the importance is that uh, this contributes to the debate of the human impact in the extinction of the Megafauna, the start of the sixth extinction, as it is called, because there were five other big extinctions in the fossil record, and this should be the sixth, and it's not the consequence of the impact of an asteroid, but of, uh, of the human impact. And of course, um, having said so, I always finish this uh, kind of speeches. Uh, telling that uh, the same brain that made us so successful in terms of uh, our evolutionary um, status is the one that uh, promotes us to be ethical, to, to have uh, the perspective of the consequence of our actions, 
and that this success is not completely satisfactory for us because it implies the extinction of <coughs> species in the, in the wild. Um, but um, I, I like to finish always this, uh, uh, this message with, with uh, an optimistic note because precisely once we uh, share this, we create this knowledge and we share it and we uh, have collections that are where those uh, fossils are kept in conditions that are good enough to gather evidence from them uh, and once we share in this kind of meetings um, I am optimistic enough to find this very difficult uh, balance between human prosperity and care of the natural environment. And to finish that, uh, a short video of the site as it is excavated. And you see the, the dam, and above it, Okay, and you can visit our web pages, arroyodelviscaino.org y megafuna3d.org, or you can consult Martin, who's responsible of the beauty of those sites, and it's very, their very existence. And uh, well, uh, thank you very much. I hope I uh, I'm on time, aren't I? Thank you very much. <laughs>
where in Paris in April that he finished uh, this this uh, work as a as a supervisor. I know that those promises by students are weak, but anyway, it's as imminent as it can be. And do you plan to have? Uh, Archaeologists or specialists of this period to participate in the excavation because this would be the best way because you actually your eye is perfectly it. trained to spot the smallest bone. Of course, bowl of course. In the site, as it is very muddy with water, uh, it would be interesting, I think, for you to have uh, the expert eye. Oh, yes. Uh, now, can I just get a spot there? We invited a few of them, uh, but um, none has uh, taken this site as their main priority, and I can't understand why. <laughs> but uh, people have all sorts of different opinions about things, and I'm a democratic person, and I eventually have to tolerate it. <laughs> now, uh, seriously, uh, we invited uh, some of those, some have. Had something about it, and uh, well, once we collected the, the, the stones, the glyphics are are collected as they are should be. Uh, and they are in the collection. Precisely, uh, the importance of collection is, is among others that, and they are being studied by, for instance, uh, this uh, student by um, Eric Boyas. But uh, every archaeologist here is uh, warmly invited to join us. As I've prepared on a daily basis, <laughs> because uh, there's plenty of wood and no wood no, no whatsoever. But you need an archaeologist for a class like or train with the older sites. Distances are a problem, but on the other hand, we excavate in the southern summer, yeah. mm -hmm. so you can escape mm -hmm. from the harsh yeah. of the winter. Yeah. <laughs> there are beaches uh, not far away. After the excavation, you can go. Any other questions? Uh, how do you compare with? Uh, Brazil, all the sites? Some of them, yes, um, with uh, Pedra Fulana. And uh, there are other places as well, Monteverde, in Chile, and there's other places in, in Ecuador as well. There are many candidates for very, very old sites before the last glacial maximum. Um, there's a very recent, uh, this, this month has been published a paper about uh, sites in the Colorado Plateau at 37,000 years of, of age. And, and uh, sorry, it has for five years the finding of a mastodon having been processed for tools, for bone tools in, in San Diego, in San Diego, in California at 130,000. Um, uh, I think it's a very bad time for it. Oh, this uh, is it's uh, it's uh, you mean better for that? No, um, this one, right? yeah. uh, so maybe there are other things. There might be, yes, there must be, there should be. You spend nothing on, on accommodation. <laughs> you have to travel. You have to travel. You are an archaeologist. No, I'm an archaeologist. But I started not so. Sorry? I started not so. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> no, but I think this kind of debate, you know, something is that is out of the common uh, date or the date you are expected to find. It's a, a, a recurrent problem 
Yeah, but this thing of association and they so um and this is what shows that the problems in history are also our problems. You know, that there is this kind of different context, you know, that it's not the same context as in the uh, 19th century, but or the early 19th century, but uh, these kind of questions we are here and how to connect and how to prove that those things are true or not. A trace is a clear indicator of what we believe in this, you know, how to, you know, as I was talking about, about micro traces, you know, this is a concept that didn't exist in the century, it is more 20th century, but you know, all the devices and tools uh, that we That's have right. to do to elucidate. And uh, if I still have one minute, I, I, want to, I want to ask something very important. I passed by because I, I had to hurry up. And it's that uh, no one is right in science. Always be. Uh, some of the best influences I had is from a uh, close friend, Gustavo Politis, who works here, and uh, who's a close friend and very skeptical, both things. Then I know his uh, criticisms do not come from, you know, bad feelings about myself because he's my friend, uh, but uh, because he thinks so. And this is the best contribution. Uh, as, as in football and other sports, your opponent is your best mate because without a rival there's no game so we accept don't be intolerant accept criticism they are contributing to the best of your interests the web <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, our next speaker is Marina Sardi. Marina is a biologist, a physical chemist. So, uh, our next, next speaker is Marina Sardi. Uh, she's a, a physical anthropologist. Biological. Biological. Uh, okay, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, in translation, she means that. Uh, um, she's uh, in charge of anthropological, anthropological collections. And so, this is what she's going to tell about this kind of collection uh, she's in charge of. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm thank you. I of our project, Sico. <laughs> As uh, I work in the uh, anthropological division at the La Plata Museum, which holds uh, many collections that has been considered for decades of what is uh, known as physical anthropology. But uh, in our discipline, which we talk about biological anthropology due to evolutionary frame, frameworks very different to those from 20th century or um, 19th, 19th century. Well, the title of my presentation is Faces on the Move from Oceania to Display to Oblivion. And it deals with the case of a much smaller scale that, than those that has been previously presented, such as archeological sites or museums. Uh, it is about a collection. Physical anthropology became established as a natural science in the 19th century with the major goal of ident identification and classification of human races. 
This knowledge was mainly developed, developed on the ba basis of, of theological collections and anthropometric measurements, but also on paintings, drawings, or sculptures. Molding and casting were part of the various knowledge making strategies of anthropologists. Cast of faces, hands, and feet were realized by naturalists or amateurs during their voyage or uh, to colonial territories or in uh, international exhibitions. Faces were chosen because they were considered to better express uh, racial types. And according to Feneke Sislin, it was also a reaction to the domination of anthropometry in physical anthropology because numbers did not capture peculiarities that can be that could be easily perceived. Um, easily perceived. <laughs> this presentation focuses on a collection of facial masks obtained from native people from Oceania from live life subjects held by the anthropological division of the La Plata Museum. It is organized in three rounds. How this mask came to be, how and why, uh, sorry, how and with what purpose they were acquired by this, by this institution and what happened with them in the last eight years. I revised archives of the anthropological division, archives of the Ward project, which are available online, fortunately, and some bibliography. And also I, I made interviews to a, an anthropologist and a, to a preparator in the a, anthropological division to get more information. A, finally, I remark on some points of this a, of discussion around this collection. Um, and since uh, it is a work that is just beginning, uh, many issues are still open. The, the German traveler, the German traveler naturalist Otto Finch made this mask when he visited the South Pacific between April 1879 and January 1882. Finch obtained, obtained mouths of the faces of native people from Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, and others. From each subject, he recorded name, gender, and the estimated age, together with other anthropometric observations, like skin color with the uh, broadcast chromatic scale, table, sorry, and photograph. His mask represented in his own words five human races from 31 major islands or groups and 61 different localities. Even when the great variation that he observed precluded him to separate races in other texts. Finch travels were supported by a grant from the Humboldt Foundation for Natural History Research and Travel with the purpose of accumulating, accu sorry, accumulating collections of natural history, physical anthropology, and ethnography. In 1882, um, Finch returned to Germany, shipping, shipping with him the Mulash, together with collections of almost 300 schools and more that, than 200 samples, hair samples, body measurements, outlines of hands and feet, sketches, and hundreds of photographs. But he considered his series of facial masks the masterpiece, the piece de resistance of his collection. All materials and records became the property of the Royal Museum in Berlin, but since travel expenses were not enough, and Finch used personal funds, he was permitted to keep any items considered as duplicates. In Germany, Finch reproduced the mask and the first series, uh, mask and copies of the first series were sold to many museums from all over Europe, such as Florence, St. Petersburg, uh, and Paris. In January 1883, 
once in Germany, Finch offered his collection to Henry Ward. Ward was a businessman who created the Ward's Natural Science Establishment in Rochester, United States, one of the most important films, films in the commerce of specimens of natural history. In February uh, 1883, Finch accounted to Ward the number uh, he, uh, Finch put, uh, wrote letters to Ward to offer his collections. Uh, many letters of Finch uh, are available online. They are very interesting uh, regarding all information that is there, how he offers, how he tried to convince Ward to buy his collection and all the problems they had uh, with the shipment. Uh, unfortunately, the responses of Ward are not available uh, at the sites of the Ward project. But uh, one can see that uh, in, in January, uh, he offered the collections um, and uh, he told something like this. As the catalog of my collection of plaster cast of faces uh, of men is not yet finished, I send you a list which will show you how valuable this collection is for study. In fact, every museum of renome will be obliged to have the whole series, which forms the most important material for anthropology every collective. Uh, I need not to say how much trouble I had in making this cast among them a lot of pure, among them a lot of pure savage, uh, referring to people. To each individual is a scientific notice giving size, color, hair, etc., as well as notes on the different races and tribes. This cast will be sold, will be sold color in true color, taken after the living individual. I thought the best would be the best would be you reproduce the cast in your institute and let me have a percentage of each sale, having full confidence in you. But the great value of my collection are um, to show that individuality in wild races varies nearly <coughs> even much as in civilized races. In May, in May uh, 1883, Finch manifested the intention to send a catalog which he would, would write with which he should write, and the need to send to war some color ma mask. But Finch also recognized that he didn't know how, he didn't know who could paint the mask. Um, here you can see uh, how he tried to convince him about the interest for anthropologists, etc. In, uh, in order to, conv to convince what he wrote. As the scientific interest for anthropology is growing, I do not doubt that all leading institutions will, will buy the collection, which forms beside a stately and attractive view for a public museum. According to letter written on November, uh, eight, um, 1885, two years later, it is possible to suppose that there were problems with the shipment of masks because many letters are full of regrets, full of sentiments of disappointment and of accusations to someone called Castaño, who, according to letters, was the painter of the mask. And it seems that Castaño ask his son-in-law to ship the mask to the United States as, and his son-in-law uh, made n'importe quoi, <laughs> and the mask never arrived. Um, in later paragraph, uh, Finch hoped that there was no other difficult and wrote, uh, at, at last the whole collections has arrived in Paris, Florence, Petersburg, etc. And I may tell you that I have been very much pleased by the letter I received about Prof. Catrefaches 
and Prof. Mantegazza speak in the most probing terms and rank this collection as one of the most valuable addition made for the anthropological science in general. I go to publish the testimony received from those first authorities, Birchhoff included, and shall send you a copy. In the letter of January 1885, uh, there are still regrets about the expedition of the boxes. I did not hear anything about the boxes, claimed Finch. And in a later paragraph, uh, Finch advised Ward in the manner to make copies from this a facial cast without affecting the colors of the mask. Because if you have to do several copies, those casts that are painted will uh, be damaged. Uh, in uh, so, uh, some months later, Finch sent himself, himself the boxes to the United States. They arrived. And then Finch wrote to, uh, to War from Bremen to send testimonials from these authorities, Birchhoff, Catrefasius, Mantegazza, Giglioli, and von Schrenk from St. Petersburg. Finally, uh, in uh, 1880, in a uh, 1888, the catalog of the mask was published uh, with all the testimonies of these of, of, uh, anthropological authorities. Here in this catalog, you can see Dincareda, Dincaredea, which uh, is shown in this photograph. He was cataloged with the number 22. Uh, as a strong man between 25 and 28 years of age, eight, one meter, 60 centimeters, circumference of the case, typical, but with rather full lips, hair straight and black, as an example of how he cataloged people. Um, the second round, happens between the United States and uh, La Plata Museum. Henry Ward visit, uh, bought he, the, these collections finally, and Henry Ward also visited the La Plata Museum between uh, 1989 and uh, 1989, um, sorry, 18, 18, and 1890, uh, interested in the Pampean fossils of megafauna, and he purchased, purchased some specimens. Many years later, the Museo de la Plata acquired from this film, filmed facial mask. This mask remained on the walls of the anthropological exhibition for decades, as you can see here. Near some boost, uh, this sculpture of an Neanderthal man was also bought by, the, by this museum. Um, this mask remained for decades together with other uh, plaster elements uh, and paintings of American Indians complementing the, the exhibition of, of, schools, of skulls and skeletons. According to Maximo Farro, this acquisition was motivated by Herman Tenkate, the curator of the anthropological section, in order to show the physiognomic affinities of American Indians regarding people of the East Asia and the Pacific. Remember that the origin of the first America, of the first Americans was, a, was highly de debated at, at that time. And here it is not very clear, there are some bust of American Indians and some uh, some sculptures. Here you can see some some objects that are not bust, but are neither a, a facial mask of American Indians. Since, uh, since 
1897, the curator of the anthropological section was Robert Lehmann Nietzsche, who published in 1910 a catalog for the exhibition. Lehmann Nietzsche listed this collection in an every chapter named Varia, in which he included also brains, formalin preparations, and mummified remains, among other specimens. A remarkable, a remarkable fact linked with this uh, collection of faces is that in 1970, um, sorry, 1917, uh, there were this, the entire series was replicated again. These second replicas are, sorry, are cataloged with these numbers. They were not colored, and, new, and these new numbers were added to the inventory of the anthropological division. I don't know wh uh, what, which was the reason of this. Uh, nobody did any research on this mask. Uh, probably they were replicated to save work or to sell them, but I don't know. But in those years, several, many other masks were added during, uh, during this time to the uh, plaster cabinet, such as this collection purchased, purchased to Berlin, uh, which includes African uh, facial masks. In the decade of uh, 1940, the anthropological exhibition was moved to a new but much smaller place. The collection of oceanic faces was stored in a room behind wooden boxes that contained skeletons. No conservation action was done on them. Considered obsolete, no one handled this collection again, neither for research nor for exhibition or teaching. In the first years of, the, of this century, storage spaces became needed for collections of human remains. Thus, the South Pacific faces were removed, uh, transferred outside this museum to maybe who are from this institution know very uh, near from here, there is a large uh, storage uh, where each division, each scientific division also um, um, technical spaces have the possibility to keep all objects, broken furniture, uh, collections like this, uh, fossil moulage, and everything that is not, uh, us, uh, that has no, uh, utility that that are not uh, things that are not used uh, again uh, most of uh, and there this uh, collection was transferred most of them were wrapped with plastic bags and no conservation conservation action was held hereafter other uh, masks as you can see are uh, in wooden boxes Contrasting with the active, la active life of, the, of these faces more than a century ago, they have been in silence for about 80 years. Uh, this case represents how faces which were supposed to support strong racial, racial markers were moved across geographies from Oceania to Germany, to the United States, to Argentina, and within the institution from display to storage, to a new storage, to some kind of oblivion. I would like to introduce some remarks uh, uh, that this case enabled to discuss. The first is about value. Facial casting uh, was similar to photograph in their goal of, of obtaining visual representation of races, but it differed regarding the material and the personal implications. It required increased time and training and great quantities of plaster doing 
a, a single mold should need it one kilo of plaster around. And it was an intrusive practice involving coercion and negotiation with natives. According to Hoes, who analyzes Finch travels, uh, such casts require the subject to lie still for 40 minutes or more during the application and drying of the plaster. Eyebrows, eyelashes, and facial hair, if present, had to, have had to be well greased to prevent the plaster from sticking. Even pure plaster emitted heat while drying, causing discomfort to the subject. Plaster adulterated with lime could result in serious burns. Finch himself confessed that he sometimes wondered how it had been possible to convince so-called savage of whose language I did not understand a word to, un to undergo what he acknowledged was not precisely a pleasant process. This disconform discomfort left sometimes traces. As we can see in this cast, see here, this cast is on the anthropological division. It does not belong to the Finch collection. Uh, and it captures not only morphology, but some reaction to the fact, to the, to the plaster drying in the face. All these difficulties faced in the field provided epistemological and commercial value to Finch's collection together with the opinion of recon recognized anthropologists. Another remark that I would like to introduce is linked to the comparative anatomy of human races and the uses of plaster. Firstly, as for other naturalistic collections, plaster objects enables the representation of unique or exotic specimens and reconstruction of extinct species and their uses in exhibition, teaching and research. Finch collection belongs to a period in which the visual, visual observation of large, large series of skulls, skeletons, or masks was privileged, but the distinction of races in large series was not evident for the public. Finch acknowledged him, himself that his mask expressed a high variation, which at once and paradoxically, paradoxically contested the idea of race. When this series was removed from this place in 1940 in the La Plata Museum, the racial paradigm, paradigm largely outlived. Races became represented through the display of typical specimens or ideal reconstructions. Secondly, plaster reconstructions were purchased until the uh, 1960, as we can see in this record, of an inventory. Um, however, beside these specific cases, the practice of molding and casting faces from live person was maintained in this institution until 1980s. Uh, invisible persons, as Irina told this morning, uh, such as technicians, were involved in, this, uh, in these activities. The teaching courses, courses uh, for preparators in the Museum de la Plata included also explanations on how to do facial mask up to the 80s. Uh, up to the 70s, at least, students of the degree of anthropology uh, and the night keeper of this museum were molded during courses. Among these, the face of the recognized anthropologist, Maria Esther Albeck, you can see here, who studied in La Plata and whose parents were Danish migrants, was included in the anthropological exhibition as a representative of the Caucasian race. What, that, what I try to state here is that plaster objects have been of great importance in the, uh, in the exhibitions and teaching of uh, physical anthropology than has been previously recognized. Moreover, curators of the anthropological division 
organized also itinerant exhibitions in different provinces of Argentina using much of these cast, uh, plaster objects that, has, that were done uh, here in this museum. <coughs> My final remark is about obsolete collections such as Finch mask. Firstly, it is noteworthy that with the exception of those, those objects or instruments that, ha that have aesthetic or technical, technical value, obsolete, obsolete collections begin to occupy, to occupy marginal spaces in the institution. If preservation effort see, efforts cease, these objects are forgotten, then probably broken. The paradox in the case presented here is that since nobody handled the mask because they have been in some sense, in some sense deaccessioned, they are somewhat preserved. They are covered by, uh, by dust, but nobody touched them. <laughs> Secondly, since intellectual material and curatorial labor are required to maintain collection, this case illustrates the challenge for museums that obsolete, obsolete collections are. New, mean, new meanings or new life are to be, give, to be given to these collections. A thing discarded by science but salvaged by history, as states Boris Jardine, can represent part of the scientific memory and many narratives around these objects. Um, about what these objects can uh, told about. For instance, disturbing past, the ocular centrism of exhibition, the commerce of scientific objects, teaching activities of technical expertise, uh, the, the life, the work of technicians are of uh, um, 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 people implicated, people who was represented by this mask among others. However, considering the conditions in which facial masks of the South Pacific uh, were produced, ethical issues must be regarded. Many thanks. Um, perhaps we, because we have uh, the next speaker is on Okay. Perhaps yeah. we yeah. no no yeah. yeah. <laughs> Se activa, se desactiva. Yo ahora. Cuando vas a hablar, se activa el micrófono. Luego. Ahí, ya. Eh, Ilia, hi. A ver. Uh, hello. Okay. Now it's okay, right? Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, yes. Okay. Hi, Ilia. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Um, okay. So, <coughs> better than so, I was earlier this week, but uh, sorry not to be there. Yes, sorry. So, uh, so I, I will present you and give you the word. Yep. Okay. So, Ilya, Ilya Newland was expected to be here. So, but due to the several problems that are Hello. currently, Hello. yeah, uh, in Schiphol in, in Amsterdam, um, the cancellation of flights and so on. It's okay. So, are you listening to me? Yes. And so he couldn't come on Saturday, and he was feeling well. He was not feeling well, so he decided not to come. And he is presenting from Amsterdam. 
Yeah, right here. And he, he, uh, Ilya Newland has a book on the copies and the cast of Diplodocus. So when during the visit to the museum, we saw one of the uh, one, one of those skeletons. There are many in the world, and we invited. Uh, okay. But uh, we invited him to talk about his work on Diplodocus, and he includes also the, the casts of Iguanodon that is, uh, is also uh, exhibited here in La Plata. So these dinosaurs, uh, which were replicated and shipped to different museums in the world, and he is one of the experts in the world dealing with this kind of um, industrial dinosaurs. Uh, Ilya? Okay, perfect. Okay, welcome and thank you very much. Your micro. Yeah, okay. I'm, I should be good now. Yes, yes. Yes? Go ahead. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah, yes. sometimes what, what what PowerPoint sometimes tends to do is not um, moving the screen on, but I can sort of see an edge of it from my own camera. So I hope it's good. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been listening to the, the previous two, two talks with a lot of interest. Um, as I said, I'm sorry not to be there. I was a bit unwell earlier, la earlier last week. On the other hand, it's like 30 degrees out here now, and it's, I think it's like five where you are. So there's an, there's an advantage in every, uh, with everything, I guess. Um, I want to do a brief talk today. Uh, I think I'll be about 20, 25 minutes, and then we could probably have a bit of a, uh, a discussion afterwards. And what I want to talk about is uh, the use of cultural diplomacy to cast the nations at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, I think it's useful just first to define what cultural diplomacy actually is uh, or how it's defined. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary gives it as the exchange of ideas, information, art and other aspects of culture among nations. And, um, and now I've got the problem that I'm slightly blocked, blocking my own uh, well, and there is in order to foster mutual understanding. But I do think this in our case, at least, uh, doesn't really qualify, it isn't really that accurate and perhaps uh, a bit too idealistic. So I, for the purposes of this talk, I want to um, replace it by uh, my own definition as the exchange of cultural significant objects to create an atmosphere of cultural understanding, often with an ulterior motive unconnected to either of those objects, by which I mean that often cultural diplomacy is one of a tool or one of the tools used to achieve a certain aim that has nothing to do with culture. And I think that's what we're going to see here as well. So but this uh, exchange of cultural objects to, to um, foster a relationship for whatever purpose has been going on very long time. Uh, already in ancient times, we can see things like the exchange of um, for instance, library books are whole libraries, and this is something that I, really goes on until the present day. Something similar is also, for instance, the uh, use of works of art, significant works of art, to uh, not only highlight your own position, but also to curry favor with an opposing party. Um, this is uh, one of Jan Samradam's works that were presented to King Charles II in 1660 in order to avoid a war, which didn't really help because 12 years later we had a war. Um, uh, this also ha happens in the field of, of natural objects. It's not only cultural objects, it's natural objects, even geological objects every now and then. And uh, one of the most famous examples is the giraffe that was donated by um, Sultan Muhammad Ali of Egypt to uh, King Charles X in uh, 1825, which made its way from Marseille to Paris, uh, to Paris um, and gained a lot of interest. Um, and that was actually a very fairly, it was part of a, a, a packet of gifts of the, the Egyptian Sultan to the French king. Of course, France had a very 
big influence in Egypt. So already you can see the power play at work there. Um, after it died, it got stuffed. Uh, and uh, up until the present day, is is uh, can be seen in uh, Paris as a Museum d'Histoire Naturelle uh, in the Jardin des Plantes. Um, something similar can be uh, told about the lion that was given by the Bay of Algiers to the King of Sweden in 1731. And here we can also see what the, one of the one of the problems of such um, of such donations when. The lion was gifted, it died within a few years, then uh, it was skinned and the bones taken out. It was stuffed uh, about a decade later by someone who only knew lions from um, heraldic images and reconstructed the lion uh, accordingly. But it doesn't really look like a lion to us. So this, this practice was well established by the time that the first dinosaurs were discovered in the beginning of the 19th century. And I will primarily will be talking about two dinosaurs, one being Iguanodon, the other being Diplodocus. Um, Diplodocus is not in the last class place, of course, because the only Diplodocus that I have really seen alive uh, stands in the Museo de la Plata um, and was donated by the American philanthropist uh, um, Andrew Carnegie to the museum in 1912, but I'll get back to that. In 1822, um, the uh, Englishman Gideon Mantle discovered the first remains of what was to become uh, known as uh, Iguanodon. Iguanodon stands for leg, uh, Iguana Tooth because um, of the fact that its teeth rather look like uh, enlarged teeth of, a, of, a, of an iguana. It's a bit of an unlucky find because it's about the only part of the uh, a dinosaur that looks anything like an iguana. But it's the name stuck and really stuck until the present day. Its first reconstructions were also very speculative. Uh, the, one of the oft mentioned results is that the thumb was, bone was actually placed on the nose of the animal, which always causes a lot of laughter, but it's really a very understandable mistake, given, given also given the similes to iguanas. Uh, but there was really very, very little known about the animal. And we, in hindsight, we can see that really helped uh, to engender public interest in the animal because um, it left for a lot of room for speculation, as we will see. And I think a lot of the way in which we view animals, uh, these animals like uh, the dinosaurs today, has a lot to do with those first few years still. Um, what helped the faith fate of Iguanodon, uh, along with the installation in 1854 of a couple of statues of the animal in South London, in the Crystal Park Palace, where they can be seen until the present day. Um, we see a, a, a pair of Iguanodons here. Uh, the one um, on the lower right is more or less designed according to Mantel's views, and the one to the upper left um, has uh, the influence of Richard Owen, the man who helped Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins in London to construct these animals and these uh, statues. Um, a famous happening uh, took place at the opening of the exhibit when ben Waterhouse Hawkins, um, the, the sculptor, invited a bunch of people involved with the study of nature and the study of dinosaurs in particular to dine with him in the mold of one of the statues. But all these things helped to, um, to, to, to uh, curry, curry fame for the Iguanodon uh, statue and to, to cement it as a quintessentially at that time British dinosaur and British animal. Of course, there were very little um, qualms about portraying it also as a very cruel animal. These animals were typically portrayed as anti-deluvian, anti so stemming from before the time of the Noachian flood uh, and coming from a world where uh, anything was anything it went, it was wild, it was still untethered, it was before the, the, the god had, had cleared the, uh, the, the earth of all the wrath. And uh, this was, a, at least in the public arena, a view that held for a very, very long time, uh, but also helped to get more of a sense of wonder about these animals because they were really not only looking into the past of our world, but also looking in the past of the Bible. So there's an element of the book of nature still going on here. 
Um, that all changed a bit in 1878 when no less than 29 fossils of Iguanodon, uh, different species nowadays, Iguanodon bernicetensis, were found in a mine shaft in the south of Belgium. And this was to critically change our view of dinosaurs because they were not these heavy elephantine animals, but we were starting to use entirely different um, templates for the uh, anatomy of this animal. Moreover, they ceased to become quintessentially British. These were, in all, to all extent, the, um, say, the EU dinosaurs. They, they united um, Europe to a large extent, even more so when other specimens were found later in the 20th century in other parts of Europe. Reconstructing Iguanodon used an entirely different template. Rather than using these sort of lizard, these iguanas as the example, um, the, uh, the, guy, the people, uh, Lodovic de Pau and Louis Dolo, who reconstructed these animals to be exhibited in a museum, um, went to uh, the examples of an ostrich and a kangaroo, which sort of explains these very 20th century tripod stance dinosaurs with their tail dragging behind them. So uh, these are the examples that were used by, um, um, by Dolo and in the Pau. Um, also, the animal looked very different from what we used to so far. The, uh, the, the, the skull, for instance, was one of the first complete skulls discovered of any dinosaur. And it also looked very different from anyone, uh, every, anything everyone ever had expected. So this made these dinosaurs to really, really um, sought after uh, item. And already from a very early point, the Belgian, uh, the Natural History Museum in Brussels is approached by other museums, asking whether they can have certain bones or even encartized skeletons of Iguanodon. And this is going to become critical in what we're going to talk about with regards to cultural diplomacy. Um, the, the animals were exhibited uh, from 1882 onwards, initially in a great, large glass case on the outside, which turned out to be a really bad idea because, um, because of the heat engendered by the sun. The um, bones had been treated with tar because they had a very high pyrite content, which meant that if they were exposed to oxygen, they would uh, tend to fall apart. And people hoped that the tar would alleviate the problem uh, Eventually, it didn't. So nowadays, um, they can be seen in a case that was constructed later inside the museum. So these, this is inside the museum. Um, there are a, in total eight skeletons. So there's 21 of them uh, still uh, left unused in this exhibit. Um, and these, again, can be seen until the present day. Uh, by force of necessity, it needs to be said, because it's impossible to take the skeletons apart, quite apart from the fact that they can be considered object of cultural heritage nowadays, but they, should, they need to be physically uh, damaged to take them apart, both because of the fact that some bones are fused uh, by the fossilizing process, but also because of the way in which the Pau and Dolo reconstructed uh, and mounted the animals for display by using wood wedges. Um, then the, case, the, 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 the question arose uh, on the part of the, um, uh, the Belgian, the Belgian uh, Museum. Can we give these things away? But the problem of the Brussels Museum is that their collection wasn't very big. So they thought they could use these uh, objects in order to get uh, exchanges from other museums. Now, this reached a... Um, a political level, even to the national parliament, where which expressly forbade giving away any of these fossils to uh, an external power. So the problem then was, how do we exploit these? How we do, do we use these as a kind of crowbar in order to um, enlarge their own collections by exchanging them with other museums? And the, the rather inventive solution was make copies of them. Which was, um, which was an, uh, 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 of course, uh, as you've been discussing, uh, no doubt today, uh, was a practice that was, went on in the arts business for a very long time. The only problem was that bones are really, especially the, the uh, iguanodon bones were really brittle, so they, they, they damaged easily. And the other problem was that they were very irregular. Um, by and large, 
art objects tend to be fairly regular, smoothed off, etc. Uh, these bones obviously were. And so most of it was cast. Uh, part of it was also sculpted in order to reach the same effect. You can't really say that it's a one-on-one -on -one copy. There has been, there, there have been made some alterations. These were donated to various museums in Europe uh, with a very express permission to get other objects in return. So we can't really speak of cultural diplomacy here. It would become significant for a later example of cultural diplomacy that I'm going to go into. There is an exception though. Um, there's one iguana on in the Statuette Museum in um, uh, Cambridge, uh, which was placed there in 1896. And it was given to that museum by um, King Leopold II of Belgium. Now, um, and this was expressly a, a gift to the museum. It was not something in return. Um, and one of the reasons was that at that time, Leopold was in a spot of bother and needed to do something to improve his public image. Um, but we'll get back to that. Let's see. Okay. Um, so iguana and, and the, but these uh, gifts had a really big impact on um, fascination for dinosaurs and it continued well into the 20th century. One good example is 1909s uh, when the uh, zoo near Hamburg in Germany opened a prehistoric park. One of in which feature one of the most prominent objects which featured was uh, an iguanodon sculpted by the German sculptor Joseph Pallenberg. Um, this was uh, gotten off a similar effort, uh, not quite as successful in Copenhagen two years before that. Uh, and it again, it's still there. You can still see it if you like too. And this was copied in 1913 by the Berlin Aquarium. Um, not so much copied, it's a very different sculpture, but the whole motif uh, and the expression of a European dinosaur was used by the Berlin um, um, Zoo as well. And you can even see it in something as mundane of the, such as these ice sculptures that I found in a magazine from 1912 that clearly portray to Iguanodon. So it really goes to show the familiarity with Iguanodon at that time and as, a, as, a, as an object of European culture, which also shows that why it was such a, um, um, a sort of object by the Belgian king to get, uh, to sway public opinion in his favor. Um, it also arrived in fiction such as Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World of 1912. But what, why it becomes interesting, when it becomes interesting is when we see that the influence these sculptures exercised on the guy that we see here on the right, uh, Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie was a steel magnate uh, who, who emigrated from Scotland to the United States in the middle of the 19th century and was the richest man in the world by 1900. He'd given away, or he'd he sold all his businesses by then and was planning to give all his way, um, his, his worldly possession away to um, uh, philanthropy, so to good causes. And at that point, it was mainly uh, involved in building libraries, not so much for other, for heads of state, much more for, for common people. Um, in 19, October of 1902, the British king, uh, Edward VII, visited Carnegie in his castle in Skibo, of Skibo in Scotland. And when he was there, he saw this um, on the wall. It was a portrayal of a dinosaur that had recently been found by the Carnegie Museum, Carnegie's own natural history museum in Pittsburgh. And um, offhand, no doubt, the British king mentioned that he liked one of these as well which led Carnegie to turn to the director of the Natural History Museum, William Jacob Holland, and ask whether he couldn't find another one, um, find, well, thinking that the chances of finding another dinosaur within a month would be slim. He thought, and he remembered the um, example from Belgium and the Iguanodons, because um, Louis Delo from Belgium had already written to William Holland suggesting an exchange of copied and suggested to Carnegie to exchange a diplodocus instead uh, in the form of a cast and not so much a bone. And this had a lot to do with Carnegie's main philanthropy 
uh, objective of this time, and that was the creation of world peace by a system of um, legal measures into which more or less looks like the International Court of Justice nowadays. This was a very strong movement before the First World War, and Carnegie would, was setting everything on it. The idea of donating these castes to all sorts of heads of state was that through his personal influence, which Carnegie really rated very highly, the, these heads of state, like emperors, kings, etc., would be able and would be willing to listen to him, which would help his cause for world arbit for peace arbitration. Also, it needs to be said that he considered peace arbitration to be a scientific way of resolving international conflict. So this is something that's going to uh, return as well. In 1904, the first cast of a Diplodocus, this huge dinosaur, 26 meters in length, was exhibited in the Pennsylvania Exhibition Society in Pittsburgh and was therefore the first sauropod dinosaur, these long necked dinosaur to be exhibited in public. Um, it was then shipped off to London where it was presented officially on the April 20th of 1905 in the presence of a lot of important people, but not the British King, unfortunately for Carnegie. Uh, but it had a really big, um, uh, in public feedback. It led to a really big public feedback and it also led to other heads of state applying Carnegie to send them several, uh, send, them, send them similar casts, which led to casts being put up in Berlin in, and Paris in 1908. Berlin was particularly important to Carnegie because he attached a lot of value to his personal relationship with the German Emperor William II. Um, here we see to the top uh, the presentation of the Paris Diplodocus, to the top the um, Paris Iguanodon, and to the bottom a bit of, you see a bit of the tail of the Diplodocus. To Vienna in 1909, to Bologna also in the same year, briefly after Vienna, to St. Petersburg in 1910. This is actually taken in Moscow, not St. Petersburg. We don't have a photo of the St. Petersburg exhibit. Uh, to La Plata, as you may well know, in 1912, where it was erected, has been remounted a couple of times since. Um, and the final one before the First World War thwarted most of Carnegie's intentions came in 1913. So by 1914, we had a grand total of nine diplodocai, including the original one in Pittsburgh, um, in, North, in, in the Americas and in Europe. That was not the only thing, though. In 1907, the American Museum of Natural History had sent a diplodocus to um, Frankfurt uh, entirely separately from whatever Carnegie was doing. So they were trying to one up one um, to the uh, to the Pittsburgh Museum. So by 1934, when another couple of uh, diplodocuses had gone uh, given away, we see a rather intricate pattern of. Um, casts being given away by various institutions, not just the Carnegie Museum, not just Brussels, but also the American Museum on, in, um, in New York. But also, for instance, if you see um, about the middle to the right, you can see that the Bologna Museum made second generation casts, so to speak, to donate and foster better relations with institutions in southern Italy, into Naples and, and, and the northern Italy to Milan. So. Uh, the product was used left and right as an object, um, as an object of cultural exchange. And it led to a lot of reactions to satire, where we could see Carnegie coming to the museum with, uh, with a big skeleton, um, but also to the United States, where we see the product to the left eating a portrait of President Roosevelt. Explicit political commentary, where the Diplodocus was also equaled with something um, rather large and not too, not too clever. So being compared to one was not a positive uh, and other forms of satire. Uh, this carried on until well into the 1910s when the uh, later Diplodocuses were, were, were erected throughout Europe, which didn't really get as much interest um, as the first ones, especially the one in Paris uh, gained a lot of interest. And it even led to the rechristening of certain other 
um, primeval object as the Plotacus is because the interest was so high and there was a need for depictions. And we can see this up until, I think there's a state in French culture for a very long time where we, even in something as late as Tintin in 1934, we can see a depiction of the Plotacus. Um, I'm going to skip this because I'm a bit cut for time, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it five minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, it also led to scientific debate where because these animals had become so famous, they were also very attractive objects to make a scientific point, either because you think that your opponent is not the most careful in the world, or you think that your whole science is wrong and you use this example to make a wider point. Um, it was even used in war propaganda, uh, which shouldn't really have given uh, Carnegie a lot of fun because his whole purpose of the thing was to um, use the product and use it as a tool to avoid war. Um, and in the end, even tanks were named after the Plotacus. You can see uh, to the, at, at the bottom, this tank this is a British tank with a couple of French ones as well, and even a Russian one that were called, uh, called the Plotacus, which really goes against what uh, Carnegie's cultural diplomacy had envisioned. Um, let's get back briefly. Uh, this is my final point to Leopold II, the king of the Belgians. Why that plaque? Why that donation of Iguanodon to Cambridge? Um, this had to do with something called the Congo Free State. Congo Free State was a personal property of um, the Belgian king, uh, Leopold II. So the Belgian state had no sway over it, had no authority or jurisdiction. And as the 19th, as the 19th century progressed, it became more and more clear that the, the horrible um, atrocities were going on in the Congo. By approximation, something like between 5 and 10 million people in, perished in a time where uh, about a quarter of the population and the main cause was the um, rubber harvest, where when the people who didn't um, harvest enough rubber had their hands or their feet uh, amputated. As, and these messages reached uh, the Western world, especially the UK in the 1890s. Um, a campaign was set up, especially by the journalist Edmund Dean Burrell, and later confirmed by a government committee uh, led by uh, Roger Casement, which confirmed these reports. So at the time, um, that was it, it, that's why you can see the, uh, the donation of Iguanodon as a way to sway uh, public opinion, in my view. By 1901, even Carnegie was still considering donating a diplodocus to the Belgian king. Uh, but of course, for these reasons, because by this time, the Belgian king became recognized as the warmongering um, tyrant that he was, especially what the Congo work was concerned, that was called off. Um, the first um, message reaches Carnegie in 1901, they play around with it a bit, and by 1903 they call off the whole thing. Something similar, and I think this is the big, the, the big unknown, is uh, what happened in, uh, in the museum um, of Rio de Janeiro, the, the museum that unfortunately burned down a couple of years ago, um, where the uh, triumvirate of um, the museum director uh, Joao de la Serda, um, the Brazilian ambassador to the, U, uh, to the United States, Jobim, uh, Joaquim Nabucco, uh, and Elia Root, a very close a diplomat and a close friend of Andrew Carnegie, approached Carnegie for a donation of the Plotacus to the um, Brazilian Natural History Museum. Um, that floundered for a number of reasons. There are really two big ones, and they both have to do with the flip side of cultural diplomacy. So um, the first one was fleet mania, which was rife in throughout the world before the First World War, um, and especially the fleet competition between Argentina and Brazil at the time, which went against, uh, yeah, Ghani went so far as to demand that they stop before he was going to donate um, a diplodocus to the Brazilians. Interestingly, he didn't do so in 1912 with La Plata. The second reason has a lot to do with the fact that he had always, Carnegie had always demanded that the head of state approach him for a donation. So it could be, 
it, it, the whole purpose of the donation was to have Carnegie, make Carnegie seem like an equal partner uh, to the head of state that they were approached by. So he demanded from the uh, Brazilians that they approach him um, for a request for the politicus. This um, not only caused diplomatic problems, but it also got bogged down because uh, President Afonso Pena died uh, early in 1909 and was um, succeeded by uh, another president who really had more important things on his mind, especially given the fact that he came uh, with his, his position wasn't nearly as strong as Pena, Pena had been. So this also shows us that there is a sort of two-edged short sword in, in uh, diplomacy. You, you can't uh, cultural diplomacy with these objects. You can't really overplay your hand or things, um, or you really get revealed as someone who is more eager than the object really deserves. A most modern um, example of cultural diplomacy through natural objects has been uh, China's panda diplomacy. And even there you can see that that now becomes as problematic as uh, Carnegie's diplom Diplodocus did in Brazil because of the demands, the public opinion is less and less um, prepared to um, accede to the, to the Chinese government, those things that the Chinese government seeks to perform with this kind of cultural diplomacy. Um, that was what I had to say. I hope you found it interesting. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's not really a rounded off story. It's something I'm, I'm beginning to explore and to compare to other uh, thing, but it does interest me, and I'm really curious what you have to say. Thank you. No, okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are going to open the the forum to questions and discussion. So we are going to put the the two presentations by Marina and you together in order to receive the questions from the public. And I don't know if there are questions from the streaming. So there are no questions here, right? Okay, so um, questions, comments. Eh, si bien si hacen preguntas, vengan acá. Eh, vení, Richard. So there is a question, but it's coming. Okay. So. Eh, Felipe tiene que hablar acá, ¿no? Ah, acá, sí, sí, sí. Hello. Thank you so very much for your nice presentation. Um, I wonder why um, the Blodocos, you partly explain it by, by uh, the collection, <clears throat> having been, the, the species have been named after this Scottish. Uh, Magnate, but um, why not? Uh, have you got any conjecture about why not uh, other uh, dinosaur relevant species like, uh, you know, Tyrannosaurus, which has had been found not long before uh, that, uh, um, th those remains of Diplodocus? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a, why is why is Tyrannosaurus the, uh, why is the Plodocus the only one where this happened? The, I think this had a lot to do with um, Carnegie's personal mission. There, I, I would say, I mean, I could go into details. I, I will briefly. Um, Tyrannosaurus has been uncovered by a um, an expedition by the American Museum of Natural History. So, contrary to the Carnegie Museum, which was basically the sort of the toy of Andrew Carnegie himself. Uh, the AMNH, as we call it, was not, was, was led by, by a collective. So it was something that was led by so the, the upper classes of New York society, uh, which make the whole part of departure very, very difficult. That's not to say that the AMNH didn't exploit um, Tyrannosaurus. They did. I mean, if you look at, at the way in which uh, theropods are portrayed in the 19th throughout the 20th century. There's a lot of Tyrannosaurus there, and um, they 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 posted it every now. But they haven't really used the object for exchange. 
they did although i have to say that all sorts of museums used for instance um the hind leg of tyrannosaurus they cast the hind leg of tyrannosaurus but that was a much more explicit purpose to exchange for other objects from the museums so this whole this idea i think one of the things you need for something to be recognized as cultural diplomacy has to be that you do have an ulterior motive it's not um you you especially in the in the in the case of Carnegie, Carnegie pretended that he did some, something purely out of the kindness of his heart, but the purpose is really, really clear from the beginning to everyone. What of course is not as convenient for Carnegie is that these objects turn out not to be nearly as influential as he thought they might have been. So that's uh, and and al always where they're placed, they're immediately locally appropriated. So uh, the the La Plata Diplodocus is the La Plata Diplodocus. Fairly, uh, very quickly, no one really associates that with Carnegie or the whole arbitration. So it shows the limit of what you can do with an object like that as well. So, okay, uh, uh, Richard sends his thanks to your reply. But I remember when when I was a question. Yes, yes, no, when, when Joaquin Gonzalez received the Diplodocus, he mentioned this mission from Andrew Carnegie. You know, it, it is mm. something, a message of peace. Uh, it was received in La Plata as a message of peace uh, by the Argentinian the Argentinian president of the University of La Plata. I have a question from, from the chat from Pepe Pardo. Ah, sí. uh, no, it's, it's for uh, uh, Marina. Uh, okay. Pepe wants to know if there are uh, other techniques to do uh, partial masks uh, than plaster, because at the time they also produce wax. So to, to, yeah. you have to answer that. <laughs> Si hay otros materiales para hacer máscaras. Acá te pregunta si había. Acá está, acá está. Yes. Um, Hi, José. Acá. Sí. <laughs> Complicated. Um, José, thank you for your question. Uh, no, uh, we, I didn't observe it, uh, any other material, uh, only plaster. Um, and the process would be no less. No, the human, okay. ah, with wax, you say that it would be no, no, not so much disturbing, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I would like to comment one thing that I think I forgot, I have forgotten, is that uh, the collection has a 100 mask. I, I didn't tell. <laughs> Any other question? For no, me? For me? No. ¿Quieres venir acá si la haces Porque si no, no te escuchas, si no. Very, very short question. Um, not all the casts were donations. Uh, London cast, the Berlin cast, the Paris cast, uh, those were by. Um, there is uh, any difference between the donations and uh, the ones that were pay off? Pay for. Uh, I'm I'm very sure that the British, the London Diplodocus was paid by the kid. Uh, Holland said so. No, 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 he wasn't. Uh, part of it was played. So the, the cast was typically the cast itself was entirely financed by Carnegie. It's also in the case of uh, the London one. But the, 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 the base, so the pedestal that was placed on, that was financed locally, as well as transport. So they had to pay for... But uh, to, to go deeper into the question is, um, they, are two, they are in two batches. So the, the London, Paris, Berlin, uh, Vienna, and Bologna, one of, the, of, of one batch, they were made simultaneously in 1904. And then after that, when they decided to go 
uh, to Russia and La Plata, etc. They made uh, a second batch. So they, they placed three, then the fourth one in 1932 in Mexico, and the fifth one was given to Munich where it has never been mounted. So um, it was all, the cast uh, were all made from the same molds. So they were, in principle, they were identical, but part of, part of the, four, the four limbs weren't there, so they had been sculpted by, uh, by the sculptors from the Carnegie, and part of the, the, the back, the dorsal vertebra, vertebrae was so complicated that they couldn't really be cast. So they were sculpted as well in, uh, individually. So there are slight differences. The other difference is that, for instance, because in the Natural History Museum in London, the tail used to run over the ground. It's placed higher up now. Uh, and people tended to steal the tailbones. So they had to make new ones of the time uh, to, uh, to put in the place of the old ones that had been stolen by the public. Okay, yeah. Uh, I read something about it in Holland's uh, diary. Uh, mm. He said that it was a discussion of how they were purchased the La Plata Diplodocus. Uh, if like London or if like mm. in Berlin. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other question? No, no more questions, no more comments. Um, so open to the general discussion or we, in order to conclude or do you have a question? Na or Natalie, or you can do you say that these were exchanges. Can you? I you say that for Iguanodon, uh, many were uh, sent with uh, in a, a kind of exchange with the museums. Can you give us an example of what was exchanged? What um, came back to Brussels? Uh, yeah. Um, I think from, um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I need, the Vienna one, I'm not sure about. Um, that was, uh, the, the, the problem is also, uh, is that the archives in Brussels are in a really bad state and they're not accessible for a large extent. So it's really quite, you have to use the, the records of the other institutions to gain some insight. I know that they received some megatherium bones from Paris or casts of megatherium bones from Paris. Um, and a, I, I think a whole host of smaller um, fossils from Oxford. So those were the first exchanges. Um, and, uh, but even so that was, it, the, the, pro the problem is also that you don't really know what, your, what the material is worth until you try doing it, because it was the first time that every, anyone had, um, exchange a dinosaur of that size with another museum. So getting a good exchange rate, so to speak, was a sort of a tricky thing. I think the Russians did a couple of mammoths, but that's about it. Yeah, but what I found very interesting as well in Marina's presentation that not mm. every, in every case the exchange is something local. So as you mentioned, you know, in the case, the Brussels exchanges megatherium from South America, by Iguanodon. And in the case of Marina, we say that the, the, the different stopovers of the collections shows the international dimension of these uh, movements and these collections on the move, and that the national aspect is there, but not always. Uh, so the, the exchange of collections or what is required from one museum to another has, has to do with the collection, and the collection is international. It is not something that is um, the local product that you exchange. And that, this is like something very interesting because it shows the international side of these movements. Yeah. Of, of, of the, yeah, yeah. You can also say that it could only happen because of that international side. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and that the museum, yeah. and the museum is something that collects, collects you know, the path of the, well, in the case of the dinosaurs is the, uh, a kind of, universal space for those animals yeah. with no yeah. land. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other common question? Mm. No, so I think we can uh, start the, 
to say goodbye, to make some concluding remarks. I think this, this last presentation connecting this international side of the exchanges is very useful. But, well, I will open the forum to the conclusions, to the general comments about the workshop and our project, the future of, of what, the next three years and that are in front of us. And this is the end of the first year of the project in a way. Uh, and well, so I am, I, I am welcoming your comments, uh, not only about this presentation, but uh, Natari, do you come um, here? Yeah. 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 Because, uh, um, so my, my first remark is that what we saw today is that specimens are very rarely uh, uh, one object. In fact, they multiply, either because there are doublons, doublets in collections so that you keep the one and you use the others as uh, exchange uh, tokens or exchange material, or because you can duplicate them in different manners. And we saw these different techniques to duplicate the specimens. And then you have all the sketches, images. And, uh, so, so it's really interesting uh, uh, when we look at, at the movement of objects that we see that the objects, they multiply, they, they, they're not just one. So, um, so we could have added, and I think we should probably, yes, the question of doublets in, in, in the collections. So, uh, because in many collecting practices uh, that we know of, it's been more studied for botany, but it's, it's the, the case everywhere. You, do, you collect the same specimen in, in many, uh, um, uh, and a certain number. And this goes on also for archaeology, where you uh, keep uh, similar specimens. And what we saw here, we saw different examples. We saw the example of Neuchâtel, so the institutions can keep the, the, the doublets, but we also saw the Finch case, where you have uh, the, 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 the collecting was funded by an institution, so the collection put, goes to the institution, but uh, the, the collector is allowed to keep the doublets for himself and then to organize his own exchange in a certain way of, 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 of uh, uh, specimens. And this is also the case in many archaeological um, collections in history that I know of. So I think it's really interesting uh, to think of how uh, a single piece uh, can multiply itself uh, so that it moves on a broader scale that uh, what uh, uh, is its uh, own, own story with them. So this is perhaps one remark that I can draw from all what we learned today. Yeah, I have a group of that I think we all shared in this fragile uh, that we have in the existence of some what Marina called obsolete mm -hmm. collections. So are these kind of collections that were very useful in terms of teaching in terms of the um, state of the art in the science of the 19th century, century, and now they are kept in the way they are, or what happened to the, to the yeah. past in, 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 in Bajamea Lea until two years ago. So this, what can we do? Uh, we historians or curators with those collections to, as Marina asked, but first, we can begin with those collections to bring a new life to them. And I think it is, you know, wonderful. Uh, they are wonderful opportunities for new research projects, for new uh, curatorial projects. And in order to explain to, to the family uh, how science was, was done, so as Geraldine showed this as the result of multiple actors or that Olivier uh, also presented, you know, this is a lot of introduce people that are not very visible in terms of the practice of 
time. So I think with all this material, we are also learning how fragile museum collections are, how transitory they could be, uh, and how interesting it could be in terms of future for doing new projects working on history, working on uh, well, the future of those transitory <coughs> and transitory objects uh, in terms of you know new opportunities for them, but also for us and our imagination. <laughs> uh, and the archives, you know, as as Ilya said, the archives in, in Brussels are in other states. So, so the situation of the archives, the situation of the obsolete collection, you know, because we believe that. The collections we see today are in other shape, but we don't know what is going to happen in the next generation of those collections. So this this equation of the collections and how the collections become obsolete, it is just a question of who's in charge of the collection. And and so I think that's important to think about for the future. Yeah, what we also saw today is that there are parts of collections, even in the most central institutions in the disciplines that are not inventorized or not well inventorized. So even in Saint-Germain, which is for the archaeology, is, is one of the major institutions, part of the collections are, are, are not in the inventories. Or not all in the inventories, so it's it's also so. This is not only the case in you know smaller museums with sometimes difficult economic positions. It's also the case in the main institutions. So because this these questions of and what we also saw is that the the limits between what is legitimate in an exhibition and what is illegitimate change. Uh, uh, in the 20th century, mostly, so the, uh, the, the chronology is very similar. It seems that uh, in the 60s and 70s, many, many things went in the in the deposits, and they were really not considered anymore as as uh, legitimate in a scientific collection. Uh, so this is also something that is interesting. That uh, you know the 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 limits of uh, what is authentic. Uh, changes in time, um, and so we we saw that today with many different examples like Marina and 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 and, and uh, also um, in a certain way Geraldine and and uh, Isabel. So it's also an interesting aspect, I think. You know, the question of what is true, authentic, um, inauthentic, or false changes uh, in in time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we also want to thank all, all of you, all of you who were here in, in La Plata, all uh, of you who uh, were online. Uh, so, Ilya, thank you very much for participating from, 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 from abroad. Um, we also would like uh, to thank the, the team here in the and, 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 and thank you very much. That, that we have a great technical uh, system so that we can stream. We have a streaming on the, on the meeting and then plus of the, the, the Zoom for the participants. All went very well. Okay, uh, at different times, but yes, yes. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, one, more than 150 people connected at one point uh, to listen to part of what we say. So this is really nice. Uh, the next step for the SICOMOVE project is another workshop uh, in Barcelona uh, in April on places of encounters. Uh, so we'll speak more about the, where do people meet and how do we, they exchange objects, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is the next uh, step in the in the project, plus the very numerous move of all the members of the project. So um, I remind you that we have the blog of the project where you have 
lots of information, lots of costs on, on the different uh, um, aspects of the research we are, we are doing. So uh, you can always have a look. And uh, yeah. that's all. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Bueno, gracias a todos los que vinieron. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, voy a invitar. Sí, estamos comunicando para dar la clase a todos. Sí, gracias. Gracias.